Right. Well, I think we can basically kick it off. So I'm going to uh, kick us off with a bit of a, a mihi pepeha. So tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Atlantic, ko Pacific, nā moana, ko Lukurlis, te awa. Ko French, ko Australian, ko Hungarian, nā iwi. He whangai aho o te iwi o nā tikuri. Ko Estahazi, ko Raharuhi, nā hapu. Ko Nigel, toku wha aipo, toku rima a maua tamariki. Uh, ke Fakatu aho e noho ana, ke Elijah Touch aho e mahi ana, ko Olivia Estazi toku ingoa, no reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tatou katoa. So hi, for those uh, who didn't quite understand the mihi pepeha, I'm Livia Estahazi and the Program Director for Alida Touch. And today I'm also your guide through today's webinar. And speaking of which, uh, welcome and thank you for attending Strategies for Encouraging Grower Adoption of New Technologies. With more than 175 registrations, I know that the, the numbers of participants are still ticking up, but we, we will get started. Um, it's clearly a topic on which people are keen to grow their knowledge and our team at the Lighter Touch program is pleased, so pleased to host this event, one of many educational forums to come. So watch this space. Um, with that said, there are many who also won't be able to attend. And we also know there are a few that will need to drop off due to uh, conflicting meetings. So for that reason, this is being, this webinar will be recorded today. First up, quickly though, what is a lighter touch? Um, so a lighter touch is a collaboration between horticulture, arable and viticulture industries with MPI as well. It's focused on helping New Zealand's plant-based food producers shift from agrochemical crop protection to an agroecological agro approach. So sustainable farming that works with nature. This program is about finding and demonstrating the tools and techniques to help our growers make that shift on farm. And there are so many reasons why this is so important in this day and age, including, of course, resistance issues, market access and climate change consequences. But a huge component of the program is ensuring the knowledge and tools reach our growers. So without uptake by growers, as you all know, these tools, these technologies and techniques are just going to sit on a shelf and won't achieve any change. So the key is the effective transfer of knowledge and concepts to growers, the extension that enables the change of behavior on farm. That's gonna shift the needle towards a lighter environmental touch in crop protection. So extending that knowledge would be easy. We all, it would be amazingly easy if there was one tried and true approach to reach our growers. But what anyone who's worked in this space will tell you is there's no one size fits all. It's about a combination of factors, including understanding your audience, the drivers for change, and the right method of delivery. It's also about recognizing that when we talk behavior change, which is what this is, it isn't something that happens overnight. It's about ongoing activity and constant nudges to move people in the right direction. So in my background, I've worked in communications and advertising for over 20 years, and I can tell you that behavior change takes time. If you think about the Legends campaign, which I worked on with NZTA, that took about 10 years to really see a shift. And even nowadays, not wearing a seatbelt is unheard of. But let me tell you, it took a considered and consistent program of communications and regulation to make that happen. So you'll get some amazing tools today, but it will take a considerable amount of time and all of us working in the right direction. Which brings us to today. So we'd love to have you walk away from our webinar with some great nuggets and even a plan on helping you support this on-farm transition, helping nudge our growers, as I said, to work with nature in their crop protection approaches and supporting them on their journey of change. We are so fortunate today to have four extremely knowledgeable presenters on this topic, and I'm looking forward to hearing from them and learning from their experience. So we're going to start with Trevor James from Ag Research, who will discuss their work with arable farmers and grape growers, focusing on strategies to address and slow the development of herbicide resistance. Next, we're going to have Jeff Kane from Manaki Whenua Landcare Research, who will discuss the drivers of adoption of new technologies or knowledge, why some growers see value and others see cost. Jeff will be followed by Denise Busel, of Scarlatti, who will look at the key components of an effective extension program and how to bring that all together to affect change. And we'll end our presentation with Jim Walker from Plant and Food Research, 
who will wrap it all up and take us through the story of changing grower practice in the apple industry before we move into discussing two extension challenges submitted by members of our audience here today. So how's this gonna work? Each of our experts will present for about 20 minutes and then we will take questions. So you can submit your questions at any time by using the Q&A tab in the webinar tool. Please send these through as they come to mind and my fabulous trusty team behind the scenes will give me a list to put to our experts at the end of their presentations. You can also look at the question list if you like a particular question Give it a thumbs up, which will tell us if this question is a popular one to help us also prioritize just in case we run out of time. I'm also going to put a couple of bio breaks in, right? So you won't have to sit there for the full three hours. So after each two presenters, we'll have a five minute bio break. Uh, and then of course, after the uh, fourth presenter as well. Right, so let's get underway. I'm going to introduce our first speaker today, Dr. Trevor James, Senior Scientist at Ag Research. Trevor has made a significant contribution to weed science throughout his almost 50 year research career, including most recently leading the five year herbicide resistance research program funded by MB. Trevor comes from a practical farming background and it was this and his innate problem solving abilities that led him to pursue a career in agricultural research. At Ag Research, his career focus has been on weeds, how to control and manage them, and what happens to the herbicides used to control them. Trevor is an advocate for practical weed management to protect New Zealand's productive ability and natural resources through education and extension. Over to you, Trevor. Thank you very much, Livia. Um, much appreciated that introduction. Um, I presume I have an audience out there. <laughs> and uh, you're there and I'm confined in a chair so I can't wander around on the stage and gesticulate like I often do so um, we hope this goes well um, first off though just a, a little aside I, I chose my background originally um, thinking that this was perfect for a lighter touch it was uh, a flock of sheep going into a vineyard to do the role that we would often use herbicides for. And I think that was, you know, was really great. Now, when I sit in front of it, it just makes it look as though I've got bad dandruff. <laughs> so, um, yeah, welcome. And so this is what we have um, done very succinctly, very quickly in a five-year program. Of course, there is much more that I could talk about, but I've just highlighted uh, things that were important to getting their message across. So the talk outline, um, why did we want to look at herbicide resistance? Very briefly, who did we work with? Finding uh, good partners is, is really important. Uh, what did we set out to do? Very briefly. And then some of our key achievements and the take-home message held this um, uh, affected our, our impact, basically, because it's all about impact. Research without impact is like uh, cold coffee. So firstly, herbicide resistance. Um, you can see there that uh, since it started in 1979, and I was party to finding that herbicide resistant uh, plant, it sort of went up slowly, but then from 2010 onwards, it started really going up fast. We believe this was because of intensification and also for various reasons, the dropping of the pasture phase in the um, arable cropping scene. So that was no longer part of the rotation. So we needed to address this. We found that other people were very keen on this, particularly Foundation for Arable Research, but also the wine industry via Brigato Research Institute, Landwise, Port New Zealand, and then three chemical firms were also very worried about the future of herbicide resistant weeds. That's New Farm, Bayer, and Syngenta. So these were our research partners. What did we look to do? This is a very brief overview, but it just puts things into four baskets. First was anticipating herbicide resistance. And here, Professor Phil Hume from Lincoln University wanted to look at what we could learn from big data. 
This is some of the ginormous data sets that exist in libraries overseas, particularly the one from United States, Ian Heap's one on world recording of incidences of herbicide resistance. The next one was changing herbicide practices. Basically here, I said, you know, I was party to finding the first herbicide resistant weed in 1979. And since then, I have been trying and preaching a message. We need to do something about it. We need to do something about it. And let's face it, was having very, very little impact. And so we engaged the social science team at AgriSearch to say, well, what are the what are the drivers? Why aren't growers taking any notice of me? You know? So that was that one. Um, research area three was then looking at identifying instances of herbicide resistance. This was a two-phase thing. It was uh, can we get uh, rapid identification tools in place, particularly DNA ones or whatever. And we want to know exactly how much herbicide uh, resistance is out there. It's uh, pretty important to know that so we can warn growers about it. And then lastly, if we find all that, what solutions can we offer them? You know, how do we manage herbicide resistant weeds or how do we offer non-herbicidal interventions to help with uh, not having herbicide resistance evolve? So very quickly now onto some results. So Phil Hume, the first important thing was to work out that actually New Zealand related closer to European countries than it did to Australia or America, which is where we had traditionally looked to for solutions to herbicide resistance. We should be aligning with some Central European countries. That was a bit of a game changer for us. He also identified what plants we should be looking for. Um, and one of them, black grass, has been imported as a resistant weed. So not only is it an unwanted organism, when it comes unwanted, it's resistant. So that gave us some idea of what to look for in the future. And when it came to how do growers make decisions about what they do on their property, and we found that largely a lot of the things were taken out of their hands. They couldn't really do much. Agricultural systems, contracts, market, you know, they were drivers they have no control over. Um, crop rotations, they could, but practicality and natural factors, they have no control over. So it's really at an individual level of awareness, uh, knowledge and skills about the subject and motivation to act that this is where we had to target our results from to uh, enable change and have an impact. Economics, uh, this was an interesting one because economics models that are floating around out there conclude that farmers will exhaust all the cheaper weed control actions, options, and probably uh, this was the same for all pesticides, unless they need to do something about resistant weeds. So that's a, another take home that we had to look at, um, breaking that line of thought. Then it was a quick test. We made great progress here, and we have now um, ready for market for somebody to pick up uh, genetic identification of, of glyphosate resistance in weeds. And this was one of the more widespread resistance in, in plants, particularly in ryegrass. And uh, other species we are close to to cover much more areas. So wild oats, um, Phalaris, Bromus and Poa species, and of course, black grass, our problem ones. And so hopefully that, you know, these will be there, a DNA quick test uh, around the $20 mark maybe, and, uh, and we can do a quick test to see whether we've got herbicide resistance. Where was it? Okay, well, when we started looking for it, we found it. So hence the seek and ye shall find. We found resistant ryegrass, south thistle, prairie grass, chickweed, and wild oats. And there you can see the map of the Central and South Island in the arable sector, the red dots being resistance are scattered throughout 
and particularly in Canterbury area, they are about 50% of the sites we surveyed, we found a resistant weed. And uh, Hamilton and the maize industry, again, look at the number of red dots there, indicating that those are properties that had a resistant weed or more. And this is the uh, vineyard, the wine industry. Blenheim, well, yeah, uh, greater than 60% of the properties that we looked at had resistant ryegrass. And it was also found in uh, Waipara and Napier. So it was everywhere. So we have new cases of herbicide resistance in New Zealand. As I said before, we've got Polaris minor, Parannua, Bromus catharticus, Lolium perenne, and uh, Sonchus, both species of it. And we have ones that we had already found, we found were more widespread. The Stellaria media, Digiteria sanguinalis, more ryegrass, Kenopodium album, but less cases of, of two um, there that have largely disappeared or have, have gone management was such that these were uh, uh, um, eradicated. The willow weed persicaria um, maculosa was is no longer exist, and Kinopodium album to dicamba has gone because of herbicide changes and herbicide use. So what can we talk about other ways? So um, cover crops was a wonderful way of reducing herbicide use, and we experimented over five years with several cover crops. Basically, legume crops were the best, um, and they still resulted in good maize yields, whereas ryegrass and oats uh, were not. But so we could reduce the need for herbicides significantly with crops that did not impact um, maize yields. And another one is a new. Uh, development, which is pulsed micro shocks for controlling weeds. On this graph, you will see the cost of various herbicide, uh, sorry, weed control options. The worrying thing is that most of the non herbicidal options are hugely expensive. If you have a look on the uh, access on the left hand side there, that is a log access. So each time you get a line, it's 10 times more expensive than the line underneath. And so things like, uh, you know, steam, hot foam, hot water, burning, all these things are hugely expensive. On that axis also, if you don't know what um, energy in microjoules means, it's meaningless to you, we have a conversion there to estimate of diesel equivalence. And you see that we're getting up there, uh, some of those things are uh, equivalent to the using 260 litres of diesel per hectare, whereas herbicides um, is way down at less than one litre of, of diesel per hectare. So this, but what I want you to look at is what we're developing, which is the um, pink one on the far left, which is just uses so little energy to kill a weed. It's amazing. The device that we have developed actually works on a nine volt battery and you wander around zapping plants, which is kind of unbelievable. Still a bit of development to go, but the, the future is wonderful if we can get enough money to look at some of these new developments. Okay, so this is just now a quick window of what we have of herbicide resistance. And so just a picture there of what the weeds are and what they're resistant to. And the patch there from in blue, that is the beginning of our herbicide resistance program. And the species we found there are the ones which are a new resistance we found out from the survey. Okay, so what we found is that basically herbicide resistance has taken a massive leap because of what we found, which is we were hoping to flatten that arrow, but hopefully that will come. Okay, so now our impact. These are the outputs from our program, okay? 
And that is a major part of it. The outputs are listed in three areas. The bottom one, the minor number of outputs, but still a large number, are uh, the orange ones, which is our science outputs to journals. So from this five years, we managed to publish 39 journal papers, which is a goodly number. But we also had every year, increasing every year, end user type output. So these are field days, group meetings, seminars, webinars, whatever, uh, to, you know, to spread the word and to encourage growers and farmers and everybody to, you know, to get on board with this. It's a way of getting the results across. And here, our partners that we were working with are incredibly important to that phase. As a research organization, we could not do it. So we need those partners. It's very important to pair with good partners. But then there was the personal touch as well, is that farmer feedback letters, so that every farmer that we did a survey on got a personal letter of, of the results for their property. So this was a, 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 a letter advising them of what we found, whether they had resistance or not resistance. And some of them, we had looked at their herbicide use programs and we gave them a little bit of advice as well as to what they could do to avoid getting herbicide resistance if they didn't have it or what they could do to minimize the impact of what they have got. So these were very important as well. So here again is it in a different form, total number of outputs. You can see, um, I can't quite because it's hidden behind me, uh, but yeah, I think that's 800 and something. And, and those, so those are the interactions that we had every year to get our message across. So what did we achieve with this? And here I am plagiarizing some uh, Slides that were produced by Matilda Gunnison of Foundation for Arable Research because she summed it up so well. The key thing that we achieved with all these communications, with talking to, to growers, to, to sharing them these major findings that we had of likely impact, of how widespread it was, of these are the weeds, we got farmers talking about it until we started we had trouble finding out how much herbicide resistance was out there. Farmers did not want to talk about it. They dealt with it silently. It was like they had the pox, to put it politely, and they just kept it to themselves. Once we started talking about it and getting there and getting in front of people, we destigmatized it. And then the growers started to talk about it themselves. And for Foundation for Arable Research, with the help of uh, MPI funding, they started the Growers Leading Change uh, project. And they had a group dedicated to herbicide resistance. So this is growers working uh, to find their own solutions. And, and I think this is absolutely wonderful and essential. If we can get growers to find their own solutions, that is, you know, a hundred or more heads thinking about the, the, the problem and solutions. And that is going to make a heap more progress than one gray-haired gray old head sitting in, a, in an office in Hamilton, you know. So that's what we managed to do, get them talking about it, finding their own solutions and talking about that with their peers. That was great. It also allowed next steps to happen, which was open talk about workshops on integrated weed management. What are the alternatives? We suggested some, others have been there for a long, long time. It was just a matter of bringing them to the fore again. It's a bit like the seatbelt, repeat preaching, and ultimately we will get there. And it started conversations on importance of agronomists to work together on farms. So, you know, it's more than just the farmer. If he needs to engage with, with his peers and also with rural professionals to collectively look at this. You know, if he is contracting to uh, a firm that wants uh, tomatoes on a certain date, 
Um, they often will uh, specify what herbicides you can use because of market constraints. Discussions need to be had about whether that is an ongoing sustainable way to work. And so these are important things um, that, that came out of this progress and these conversations were started. So what did we learn? Uh, resistance was widespread on arable farms, much more than what we thought about. We thought that maybe 5% of farms might be impacted with herbicide resistance because it was being hidden. When we started to look, we found it, and we we're up to about 50% of the surveyed farms that we looked at were impacted one way or another with some herbicide resistance. And it was much bigger problem where grass seed was produced. And this is because the so much grass seed is shattered. Uh, the numbers of grass seeds to grow as weeds in the next crop was huge. And as we all know, herbicide resistance is a, a genetic evolution and that makes it simply a numbers game. The more weeds you've got, the more likely you are to have resistance evolve in them. Uh, and then growers more willing to consider other management options. They could see that they needed to do something. And then also we had to learn how to control, this is for arable farmers, how to control grass weeds and cereals. So that's a monocot weed and a monocot crop uh, without groups one and two, which were their main resources. They are cheap, they are effective, and we had to look outside that which meant things like coming back to pre-emergence weeds, even to incorporating herbicides, pre-emergence herbicides, I should say. Uh, pre-emergence weeds, that's a good one, isn't it? Anyway, so uh, I think that's about it for me. I think I'm probably about uh, done time. And um, yeah, I'm, this is what uh, Matilda said, but for me, it applies as well. I'm grateful for the opportunity I've worked alongside so many fascinating researchers, farmers, and everything else. And also, um, it's a privilege to be able to share all that we've learned with you people. Thank Fantastic. you, Jim. Fantastic, Trevor. I know you well, can't yeah, see them clapping, this, but, but I'm, sure, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure everyone's clapping <laughs> behind, the, behind the wall. That was uh, incredible and quite eye-opening in terms of the amount of resistance uh, that was discovered and the graph going up. Uh, the other piece that I found uh, really intriguing, which very much aligns with a lot of communications out there. So all you need to do is think about um, the depression campaigns that are out there. The more you open the discussion and, and have it out there, the more people will actually admit to what's going on behind the scenes. So yeah, I can appreciate that you found the same uh, in your work as well. So thank you for that. We do have a few uh, questions that have come through. So I will go ahead and ask a, a few of them. Is the age of herbicide use over? Is the next stage going to be mechanical and novel controls like laser weeding? What are your thoughts? Laser weeding is making big progress. I don't think the age of herbicides is over. It might be starting to taper off, but it is still a very, very important ingredient to feeding the world. So weeds still are the major impediment to maximizing yields and herbicides are still critical to that. And remember, we are um, an educated nation with educated growers. A lot of the world is producing a lot of food with a lot less knowledge than we are. So in that respect, it's up to us also to develop these non-herbicide options for the rest of the world to follow. We are more than just leaders in New Zealand. We are leaders to the world. And it's good to think about that in that way. So herbicides will be there for a while, but regulations and public opinion are huge threats. Right. Excellent. Thank you uh, for that. Um, we have other questions as well. So if you do have a question, please don't hesitate. Uh, we do have about 10 minutes for Trevor here with you to answer your questions directly. So go into the Q&A section on the webinar and type away. Um, but meanwhile, I will uh, jump to the next one. EPA is a barrier for new herbicide registration. Should New Zealand focus on other technologies to combat herbicide resistance? 
Don't strap me on the EPA, please. Can we move to the next question? <laughs> this is it's a family just, show. <laughs> <laughs> it's just unfortunate that, um, you know, the ACVM, I was talking to one of their people recently, they are still meeting their promises that they will get stuff through in less than 12 months. Um, but the EPA doesn't seem to be bound by the same promises. And for whatever reason... Yeah, they are a delay. It's not that they are anti-herbicide or anti-pesticide. They are just simply taking a long time to do what they see as due diligence. Okay. Um, we've got one here. Uh, did you assess the actual uptake of alternative management strategies for weed control for the growers that had resistant weeds identified in the survey compared to growers that didn't? So in other words, was the survey a catalyst for sustained on-farm change? We didn't as part of this program. Uh, we would need to go back to Foundation for Arable Research um, because they are the ones that related directly to the growers. But it is a very, very good question. And it is probably something that might be useful to, or definitely useful to look at because that will help on pointing towards how to get the uptake. Great. Excellent. Thanks, Trevor. Uh, another one here. Trevor, often you are extending a not so good news issue such as weed incursion or herbicide resistance and asking growers to take on more and more of the action needed to overcome the issue. How can the agronomists or extensionists help the grower get past that initial negativity barrier to addressing the issue? Probably the first thing is to Get rid of the idea that this is a huge problem, but it is a solvable problem. And the behavior change that we would be looking at them needing to make doesn't necessarily need to be a big one, but it does need a, you know, a little bit of education and the acceptance of a few more ideas. For some things, it might be uh, an initial outlay with, with equipment. Um, it's, it's interesting that in my career, this equipment was largely there when I started, but I saw the shift away from cultural methods into herbicide uh, control of weeds to the point where that was exclusive. And, you know, this equipment might still be there rusting away in a corner, um, but now we've gone the full cycle, as I say, in my career. And, and so it, it, it shouldn't be too hard. They yeah. were controlling weeds without herbicides when I started, and we just need to get back there. So yeah. it, it's kind of that shift. Things have changed and uh, intensification has increased, but uh, they're not problems that are insurmountable. It's, you know, that's my opinion. Yep. No, no, no. Agreed. And there's so much that does actually go full circle and come back to how your grandma did it in the old days. Is actually well, weeds were controlled good. for many, many, many more years, centuries, eons even, than we've controlled them with herbicides, which yeah. largely weren't developed until after the Second World War and didn't become widely incorporated until the, the 60s and 70s, you know. Yeah. Um, here's another, did the cover crop reduce the weed pressure as a competitive advantage? Is that a question or a statement of fact? I don't know. Did the cover Sorry? crops reduce the weed pressure as a competitive advantage? Did they? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what we also found with the cover crops is we reduced the weed seed bank. And so that was another important finding, which I didn't report there because I got short of time. But one way that cover crops impacted it was simply by reducing the number of weed seeds there. What we found was that also because the cover crop was not removed, but flattened and planted into it with direct drilling, the thatch that the cover crop left behind um, meant that we didn't need a pre-emergence herbicide. So we reduced the herbicide regime to one post-emergence herbicide if required. Fabulous. Thanks, Trevor. And actually, in that same vein, I'm not sure if this is a question or a statement, but please can you enlist the non-chemical management techniques of IWM? 
Uh, in a nutshell, well, yeah, there, there's countless of them. Okay, and some are more effective or costly than others. But in that graph, those were all the non-chemical incursion IWM methods. Okay, some of them are highly developed and, and others aren't. Interrow cultivation is probably the most widely spread one. But once again, we need to look at how organic growers are achieving this and just pick their brains for a little bit because they are usually managing their weeds and pests uh, quite well uh, with other methods. So, um, but they're, you know, as stated in an earlier one, uh, lasers is, is, is making brilliant technology, whipping through and, and hitting individual weeds. We have a bit of a problem in New Zealand, though, because of our lovely climate and summer rain and everything. Generally, the weed pressure in New Zealand is much worse than anywhere else in the world. Wow. Except possibly Europe, which is why we're needing to align there. But then there's Europe. If you follow Europe, there's lots of technologies being developed, you know, uh, precision ag, you know, tools which are guided by satellites and all this to get in really close to plants, inter-row weeders, inter-row weeders, you know, the, there's there's all sorts there. I'm sorry, I can't give you a bit. No, 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 that's, this is, uh, this is good. And I think this next question, it could be a, you know, a one hour piece, but just very, very top line. What do you need to do to commercialize your technology? We need to have, um, as, well, which technology, uh, the testing or the um, or the non-herbicide thing? That's so, say, but... yeah. So the testing is the briefest. We just need to have uh, one of the multitude startup DNA testings to pick up this method and do it. And whether that is a traditional one like Hills Laboratories or something else, or one of the newer ones. Okay. For yep. the other technology, um, that will be picked up, no doubt, by a startup that wants to develop the electrical technique. It's been published, so it's likely to be already starting to be picked up by big manufacturers overseas. We don't know. Laser stuff we started doing here, and now you can buy commercial lasers to go into your field to zap the weeds. Unfortunately, they cost about $2 million dollars. And that's an upfront cost. And then there's a licensing cost of $75,000 a year. But this will come down as well as their accuracy and, and a whole lot of stuff. And I'm still not too sure whether we're allowed to shoot lasers in the field in New Zealand. That not could be sure either. That could be I mean, a I know there's laser problem. for, you know, to, to scare the birds away, but I'm not sure that that's the same type of laser. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Um, another quick, a couple of more quick questions here. With the increased uptake of GMO, HR crops overseas and subsequent increased herbicide use, do you expect that HR weeds could go back up even after these findings? Yeah, yes, because um, GMOs did lead to widespread glyphosate resistance overseas. And so they started stacking technologies. And so now they're glyphosate resistant, they're dicamba resistant, they are other resistances as well. Um, that is not an answer, seriously. Okay. Um, GMO crops is not the answer. Okay. Um, that's my personal opinion. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Well, that's, what, that's what the <laughs> questions are here for. So, no, all good, Trevor, all good. Um, has the use of pulsed micro shocks been used outside farm systems? Can it be used for pest plant control, example, velvet leaf or pip grass? Uh, yeah, we hopefully it can be used anywhere. What we have at the moment is a little handheld machine that looks a little bit like a cordless vacuum cleaner, you know, one of those little, little yep. sucky ones, you know. Yep. Yeah. Um, it has a anode which needs to be put into the soil somewhere close to the weed. And then we have a, a spatula, which is pretty much like a fish slice, which we just put on top of the weed. So small weeds at this stage, but you know, maybe we can imagine a machine that goes around with a whole lot of paddles, bang, 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 and and a uh, nano. You know, a lot of development, but certainly possible with today's technology. Fantastic. And as I say, because of the pulses, it's high voltage, but very, very small amperage, and therefore. For this little carry handheld machine, a nine volt battery is all it uses, and you can wander around all day going bang, bang, bang with your fish slice, you know. Yeah. 
Um, grow, uh, another one here in terms of spray diaries. So growers are reluctant to share spray diaries, thinking maybe they may expose anomalies. What was your carrot to secure these? Well, how did you get them? <laughs> we all our all our survey um, was done in consultation with the growers or farmers, you know. And mm -hmm. if they had spray diaries, they were happy to um, release that information to us. And we just took um, anonymous reports, overviews, and th th they've been happy. We haven't had a, a problem of people wanting to withhold spray diaries. So, Great. Good news. A mm. um, couple more. I know that uh, we're... We're close to time. So how can farmers get independent advice? The people they talk to most often about weed control are the same people that make money from selling herbicides. Yes, yeah, so we found that, you know, we work with three chemical firms. They were only three, but we found that, well, believe that they had quite a responsible attitude, you know, particularly at the high level. They realise that they're going to lose sales if one of their herbicides um, has resistant weed. So they are. Sometimes I do wonder just personally again whether that gets down to somebody that meet needs to, you know, meet mm. deadlines or whatever. So there's a it is a bit of a problem. Uh, look, your sector industries though, Foundation for Arable Research, Court New Zealand are always yep. going to be independent and give good advice. And if they haven't got the answer themselves, they have the contacts into research to ask us the questions. And either we will try and answer them, or we will try and answer them, or get money if we haven't got the answers. Yeah. And so those independent bodies are working for you, despite what some people might believe, um, they are backing you. Yeah. Uh, actually, just on uh, Foundation for Arable Research, um, there's some several uh, fact sheets on their website for integrated weed management if people are interested as of October 2023. So that could be helpful information there. Final question, Trevor. Traditionally, stubble burning was a tool to help with weed burden. It is, is it something that needs to be promoted again to help with grass weeds public perception view aside? <laughs> yeah interesting last question for you well it is but we have an answer to that one because we actually addressed that with foundation for arable quite a while ago and we did some stubble burning trials and we discovered unfortunately that once the the seed had shattered and hit the soil it was not burnt by um, stubble burning so all it had to be was was at or, or a little bit below soil level uh, the heat goes up doesn't go down and soil is moist and you know that tends to absorb a lot of heat and we did not get good results from stubble burning in terms of killing the weed so I'm not too sure that you know we would achieve a lot doing that again because, because by the time they're allowed to stubble burn the weeds of seeds have settled down through the stubble post harvest or harvest um weed control in terms of the the chaff weed control would be much better because it's it's getting the seeds before they fall out shatter and hit the ground got it yeah yeah no it makes sense quick with Absolutely that one makes sense. yeah well, Trevor, look, huge thank you for all your insights and for uh, answering all the fabulous questions. Thank you to all of those who are asked the questions and please continue in that vein. But again, massive thank you, uh, Trevor. And we'll see you back at the panelist session yep. later on. Fantastic. And so now we're going to move along to Dr. Jeff Kane, uh, Senior Researcher for Manaki Whenua Landcare Research. Jeff has more than 30 years experience in market segmentation research in agriculture in Australia and New Zealand. He's leading, he is a leading authority on the adoption of innovations in agriculture. His experience includes projects predicting the uptake of technologies in cropping, livestock, breeding, animal health, irrigation systems, fertilizer and nutrient management, soil mo moisture monitoring and pest management. The works basically. <laughs> Um, he's undertaken projects on the adoption of technologies across a range of agricultural industries in New Zealand and Australia, including dairying, beef and sheep production, horticulture, viticulture and crop.
cropping. And so without further ado, please welcome Jeff. Over to you. Thanks, Livia. Uh, kia ora and good morning, everyone. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, Alida Touch for giving me the opportunity to talk today about identifying the potential adopters of an agricultural innovation, which is fundamentally about understanding your audience. <clears throat> And when I'm talking about an innovation here, I'm meaning things like technologies, techniques, processes, practices, and procedures. It could be anything. Uh, it could be a new way of managing pests, a new way of, of managing weeds. It could be a new planting design, or it could be doing something like installing a wetland. <clears throat> so, what are potential adopters and why are they important? Basically, they are the growers for whom an innovation would create a net benefit by assisting them to better meet their goals, assuming they know about the innovation. So fundamentally, the population of potential adopters is your market. It's the market for an innovation, the market for a change in practice. Knowing about the population, knowing about potential adopters gives you a good idea of how many will adopt and why, but it doesn't tell you when they will adopt. Um, so here are the key messages I'm hoping will come across from my chat this morning. Um, first, Researchers and policymakers have expectations about the relevance and benefits of innovations to growers. However, these expectations, in my experience, are generally unrealistic. People tend to be over optimistic about the benefits an innovation will bring and the number of growers who might, for whom the, the innovation is relevant. Unrealistic expectations mean that Growers who do not adopt are often seen as inferior. Growers who do adopt are seen as superior, are seen as innovative, leading edge, and this is incorrect. So we developed a method for identifying the number of potential adopters of an agricultural natural resource management innovation so that people might form better expectations about who will adopt and how many will adopt. And also we'll have a better method for understanding why growers adopt. What we have found in, through extensive application of the method is that a fraction, sometimes a surprisingly small fraction of growers are actually potential adopters. So what I'm going to do is describe fairly briefly, the method we use for identifying potential adopters, present a couple of examples, and then highlight the implications for research and extension. So, the growers depend on their farm systems for their income, for their lifestyle, for social and emotional benefits. Introducing a new technology or practice into a farm system is risky because systems are complex. So adopting a technology or changing a management practice, adopting an innovation is highly engaging for growers because change creates to some degree risks for in terms of income, lifestyle, social and experiential feelings. This means growers will devote a lot of time and effort to predicting the consequences of adopting a technology or changing a management practice. What that implies is that there is usually a very good reason why a grower does not adopt an innovation that apparently will generate obvious benefits. As for example, Trevor has vowed. So how do growers predict consequences? What they do is identify the elements in their farm system 
that interact with the innovation to influence the benefits and costs of adopting it. The elements in a farm system that interact with an innovation to influence these benefits and costs, we call the farm context for that innovation. These elements can be things like biophysical factors, climatic factors, resource, technological and lifestyle characteristics, and perceptions of risks. Unfortunately, these factors are different for each and every innovation. However, what's, what is useful is that usually there is only a handful, four, five, six or seven key elements that affect in the farm context that affect the benefits and costs of adopting an innovation. The number of potential adopters then is the set of, farm, of farmers or growers with contexts that suit the innovation. That is, in their farm context, in their grower context, the innovation creates a relative advantage. Differences in farm context equate to what in marketing is called different benefit segments. So how do we find this out? It's fairly straightforward. Basically, the process involves face-to-face -face interviewing with growers who have and have not adopted the practice or the technology, the innovation. And we use a particular technique called convergent interviewing to do that. And in that stage, what we do is to identify the particular aspects of the farm system that is the farm context that influence the benefits or costs of adopting the technology or practice. We then usually move on to doing a large scale survey of growers or farmers to statistically validate the interview results. So to validate that we've found out the right things and to actually quantify, measure the size of the population of potential adopters and the various benefit segments within that population. What you can then do after that is to formulate extension or research strategies to deal, to promote the innovation to your different benefit segments. And you can then conduct face-to-face -face inter interviews with growers or farmers to check that there, that your description of the benefit segments is correct and the kinds of strategies you've come up with from a research or extension perspective uh, are appropriate. So what I'd like to do is to give a couple of examples. They're pretty simple ones. Um, I've chosen some examples from um, integrated pest management in New Zealand grape production and integrate, integrated pest management in Australian fruit production, mostly because I haven't done integrated weed management um, with this technique. So hopefully the same similar ideas will come across. So with respect to pest and disease management in New Zealand grape production, um, Denise Buchan and I did some research a few years ago now. Um, and some of the things we looked at were management practices around powdery mildew, downy mildew, and leaf roller. The benefits that growers were seeking by trying to control these pests was to maintain their productivity. They wanted to limit the risk of uncontrollable outbreaks of the pests. They were trying to reduce their chemical use and their costs, and they wanted to reduce labor use. So the vineyard context, so what were the factors that in the farm system that influenced the adoption of these things were three things. Basically, the threat, the, how big the threat was of a damaging infestation, the timing of that threat, and its spatial extent through the vineyard. 
so for downy mildew, it was a pretty simple um, process of identifying the benefit segments. Um, with respect to downy mildew, the main consideration was the risk of a high, highly damaging infestation through the season. If the risk is very high, then growers were forced into calendar spraying to control downy mildew. If the risk of infestation was low, then growers were able to rely on strategic spraying, um, but that which meant using uh, monitoring and sp spraying when um, infestations reached a particular threshold. But adopting strategic spraying required having the appropriate level of machinery and labour, the appropriate capacity to respond quickly to an infestation. Powdery mildew was similar. However, here the timing of infestation was important. So early in the season, everyone was calendar spraying, so that is preventive spraying, to prevent outbreaks of powdery mildew. But depending on your climate, so your location, there were differences in the risk of a damaging infestation late in the season. If the risk of a damaging infestation was high late in the season, then you calendar sprayed all season long. If the risk was low late in the season, then what growers were doing was calendar spraying during the early part of the season and then switching to a strategic spraying regime late in the season. And leaf roller was a little bit more complicated again. So the first issue was, is the threat of damaging infestation high? If it wasn't, then growers could rely on natural predators to control infestations in the vineyard. If infestations were high, if the threat of infestations was high, then the spatial extent of the, of the infestation became important. If infestations were limited to hotspots in the vineyard, then growers were relying on natural predators in some areas and target spraying of specific varieties, uh, of specific susceptible varieties or susceptible locations in their vineyard. If infestations were spread throughout the vineyard, then growers were forced back into calendar spraying the entire vineyard. So, <coughs> The second example I'll go through briefly is mite management in the Australian apple industry. Um, the Department of Agriculture there was promoting the use of uh, integrated pest management in the Australian apple industry. So the use of predator mites to manage pest mites um, to reduce the use of chemicals but were concerned that there was apparently limited adoption of predator mites um, and that some farmers were only partially adopting the use of predator mites. So we went through the process of interviewing growers uh, that used pest, um, predator mites, growers that had tried and failed and stopped using them and growers that didn't use them. And the benefits we found from those interviews that growers were seeking in managing pest mites was again to maintain productivity, limit the risk of uncontrollable outbreaks, reduce chemical use and costs, and reduce labour use. Again, the main factors in the farm context that was driving their decision making was the threat of a damaging infestation the timing of that threat and the extent of that threat. We identified four different benefit segments in terms of management of pest mites. 
So the first factor that we identified is, the th is whether or not the threat of damaging infestation is high. If it isn't, then there's the issue of whether you have hot spots or are hot spots a problem in, in the orchard. If they're not, then growers were able to rely on the use of predator mites and usually these growers were using soft chemicals to control other pests and diseases in their orchards. If the threat of a damaging mite infestation was low, but hotspots were a problem, then growers were still using predator mites, but were spraying acaricides for hotspots to kill outbreaks of um, the pest mites. If the threat of a damaging infestation was high, then we had two different segments we identified. One group were, uh, were unable to establish a population of predator mites because the climatic conditions in their orchards would not allow predator mites populations to grow. So these growers had no choice but to use chemical sprays to control predator mites, uh, pest mites, sorry. The fourth segment consisted of growers who could potentially have a population of predator mites, but because they were having to use broad spectrum sprays, such as um, calendar spraying, organophosphates for coddling moth control, they were killing their predator mites, and so they were forced to use chemical sprays to kill their pest mites as well. So what are the implications of, of this work? Um, the first is that the adoption of soft chemicals and things like mating disruption and beneficial bugs depends on the intensity of press pressure in an orchard or vineyard. That is the frequency, intensity, and duration of pest pressures. The intensity of pest pressure often relate, relate, was related to orchard layout, its isolation from other orchards. The adoption of these of chemicals, soft chemicals, disruption, and bugs also depended on the other, the combination of other pest and disease pressures the growers or, yeah, the growers faced, and it also depended on climatic factors. What this meant was that partial adoption was often best practice for some growers. It also meant that growers' attitudes towards the environment and sustainability generally had little to do with differences in their adoption of integrated pest management practices. So what are the implications for research in terms of developing technologies, practices, products? The first is that typically the number of potential adopters of a new of an innovation is only a fraction of the producers in an industry or region. It's very rare that an innovation is useful to everyone. Second, if you know what your benefit segments look like for an innovation, then that supports tailoring research products for different segments to get different benefits. Another implication is that an individual grower comes from one benefit segment. Therefore, it, a couple of growers, one grower or two or three growers, cannot possibly represent all benefit segments. So this becomes quite important when you're considering recruiting growers to participate in research programs in developing new technologies. The implications for extension. Because the population of potential adopters is usually smaller than we think. The spread of innovations among potential adopters, amongst potential adopters, has been underestimated. This means that rates of adoption are actually higher than people think, 
and that extension has often been much more successful than we thought. The method we use means that you can develop extension messages that can be tailored to appeal to different benefit segments to accelerate adoption. It also means, and we've had experience of this, that declining attendance at field days, demonstrations, courses, etc., by farmers and growers can actually signal success rather than failure in that you've saturated the, potent, the market for potential adopters. The other thing is that early adopters are not necessarily leading farmers or growers. And some ex implications for policy are, extension accelerates adoption by reducing the time and effort farmers must invest in learning and by raising awareness. Extension by itself does not change the population of potential adopters. If we want to change the population of potential adopters, other measures are needed, such as either regulation, changing infrastructure, or research into new technologies. And lastly, the method that we developed can and has been used to help predict farmers' responses to policy measures like infrastructure change um, and the imposition of regulations. So in conclusion, farm context analysis can be helpful in the identification of benefit segments, and that can help in creating realistic expectations about adoption and extension. It helps explain why some growers view an innovation or practice as creating value, while others think it's too costly. It highlights the importance of tailoring innovations and tailoring extension measures to align with the different requirements of benefit segments. Uh, thanks. I'll bring it to a stop there. Fabulous. Thank you so much, uh, Jeff. Really, really fascinating. I particularly like the point around um, the fact that we underestimate how many people will actually, you know, get the extensions and it, it actually grows a lot, a lot better. So that's uh, fascinating. And also the leading farmers are not necessarily the ones that are early adopters. That was also fascinating yeah. um learnings there but we've got some great questions uh that are here one actually that was a more of an admin question that i'll answer live as well is um people clearly loving the slides that yourself and trevor have uh put forward so we will be putting all the slides available on our website uh, under the resource section after the webinar um, and we will email you to let you know when it's live. Um, so we've got all your emails. We'll we'll send you a link, and you'll have you'll be able to uh, grab all of our presenters' slides uh, as a resource today. So uh, Jeff, get ready for some really great questions lined up already. Um, so have trials been done using microbes, for example, rather than fungicides? I'm sorry, I have no idea. Well, there, you go. <laughs> there goes the first one. <laughs> I'm, that, I'm not that kind of scientist. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, maybe maybe we'll get some maybe, of the others. Maybe Trevor or Jim point. can answer that one. Yeah. 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 We might hold that off. So uh, the others keep keep that one in mind. So we might be able to answer that one a little bit later on. Um, would upskilling growers in risk assessment tools improve trust models and grower tech adoption? Do you think? Oh, I guess the way to think of it here is to think that he, that the practice, the practice you're promoting is the use of risk management tools. Mm -hmm. So What you need to understand then is what is that risk management tool offering growers that's an improvement on what how they assess risks now. So it could do, but it depends an awful lot on the nature of the risk that's being evaluated. Uh, so I'll give a very brief example. Yep. Um, some time ago, so in sheep breeding, there were 
two, basically two ways of evaluating or choosing a RAM. Um, one was on the basis of objective measurements of the RAM's performance mm -hmm. um, in terms of the, its progeny producing wool and the characteristics of the wool it produced. And then there was another technique that was based on um, a whole different set of visual characteristics of the wool that the sheep produced. And the way this worked was that if to use the objective measurement, you had to assume that if a, if a ram did well in one environment, it would always do better than another ram in another environment because there's a risk in moving a ram from one environment to another. Yeah. So if you didn't, if you believed that ram A was always better, that going to be always better than ram B, it, then you would use objective measurements. But if you didn't believe that RAM A would always be better than RAM B in all environments, then you use this other technique. So, so your evaluation of the risk there depended on the strategy you were using for managing that risk in moving around from one environment to another. So I'm not sure if that helps, but it means oh, you've it really got to understand in, in quite a lot of detail what the risk is and how the tool you're offering improves yeah. the assessment of the risk. Yeah. Always be aware of what you're measuring because that could also give you quite yes. a, a different answer there. Yeah. Um, moving on to this other question. It's a bit long, but it's all good. What, what you're describing sounds more like tech transfer of an innovation developed independently of growers and farmers. What about the role of true extension where farmers and growers are engaged at the very start of the problem solving process? Example, they're involved in choosing research direction and involved in the research themselves, participatory action, for example, participatory action research. Yep. Yeah. Um, so no, it's, oh, okay. What's that? So I view this stuff as a complement to mm -hmm. participatory action research. I guess the important message from uh, from this, the use of this method is it, it helps you understand the issues you face in trying to upscale or get widespread adoption of a technology or a practice that you've developed with your participatory farmers because those participatory farmers will come from a segment. So... Yep. The conditions in their property, their farm context are particular to a certain set of farmers and may not be applicable to farmers in other contexts. Got it. Got it. Um, what is the criteria for selecting growers to target for one-on-one -on -one interviews? Uh, in For this method, yep. the, um, but it's pretty simple, really. It's basically trying to find a whole bunch of growers that are doing what you want to do, yep. a bunch of growers that have are not doing it, and then if you can, some growers that have tried it and then abandoned it. And it's by comparing the, uh, the results you get from talking to each of those three groups um, using this convergent interviewing process that you uncover the fundamental aspects in the farm context that are driving the differences in decisions. Um, there is a variant of this that you can do where you can apply it when you're trying to develop a prototype technology as well. So that's possible as well. Fantastic. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jeff. This is a, a really interesting one. Did you investigate the impact of user emotion or psychology for technology adoption? Um, I have in other studies, yep. Um, it's not it's not actually relevant to this particular method because mm -hmm. here we're trying to understand farm system but what well basically and it seems fairly reasonable is that what comes out from looking at the emotional side of things is that farmers derive an enormous amount of satisfaction mm -hmm. um, and sense of achievement from being able to make things work on their property. Uh, completely uh, agree. Interestingly, uh, from my old advertising days, I'm going to pick on this one again, um, just so that we're all aware, the um, 
when you're actually talking to people and you're giving them information, that'll bring a human to a conclusion, but it's actually emotion that will flip them into action and behavior change. So when you are extending and communicating, if you tap into that satisfaction, you know, element uh, on their farm, that actually can help them help move the, the behavior quite a bit. We're all led by our emotions. Every decision you make every single day is an emotional decision, even if you think you're being super rational <laughs> anyway. So next question for you though, Jeff, yep. uh, did you gain any insights into how an extensionist might help a grower hold off a chemical intervention to allow the biocontrol to find its equilibrium? I guess again, this isn't the method's not designed to do that. Um, what I guess what the insight we do get is that going back to the stuff I talked about at the beginning, that this is all about farmers' incomes, lifestyle emotional satisfaction, sense of achievement. I guess it comes back to thinking that they'll do their best. So you can encourage them, but it's always important to bear in mind that there's all these other pressures in terms of farm performance on them. Um, so trying to, I guess, as Olivia was saying, um, hook into that sense of achievement Mm. is probably the way, one way to go in terms of trying to get them to persist as much as possible. Great. We've got three more questions. So we'll uh, we'll truck on through them quickly, uh, given timings. I think everyone needs a bit of a bio break. So um, we've got another one here. Interesting summary of this topic. Thank you. How often do you think this sort of analysis is actually done in practice prior to research initiation? Very rare. Mm. What, what happens 99% of the time is that researchers, scientists develop their technologies, sometimes in conjunction with farmers and, and growers. And that's fair enough because there's a, there's a, they see a need, which is communicated to them by industry. But it's very rare for this kind of um, market research, basically, to be undertaken before the technologies developed. Great. Um, final two questions, and I might uh, I might see if we can grab them at at ten twenty. Uh, if not, we might get you to answer them online. But we've got a couple more minutes. Uh, what are the strategies you use to design effective questions to understand the farm context? Okay. Um, there's two parts to it. So there's the what's called the convergent interviewing process, and then Within the interviewing process, there's laddering. So basically, it's all about going and just chatting to farmers and having a conversation with them about why they are doing what they do. And it starts off being very open-ended. Um, you keep asking lots of why questions. And for the first few interviews, you may come away not sure about what you've discovered, but you form hypotheses as you go along. So you might they you might, for example, go, mm, they talked a lot about pest pressure. Mm. So when you go to the next farm, you talk about that. And then when you go to someone who's not doing, for example, um, so you might, for example, talk to farms and they say, oh, I've got really good populations of um, predator mites. And then you go and talk to someone who's not using them. They might say, well, I tried it but I couldn't get the populations to establish or I had to spray for coddling moth and that killed everything. So you keep having conversations with farmers around those things, narrowing things down until you get bored because you can walk onto a property, sit at the table with a farmer, ask them four or five questions about the intensity of pressure, their ability to establish populations of, of uh, predator mites and a couple of other questions, and you know exactly what they're going to tell you for the next half an hour. Yeah. So that's yeah. fundamentally it. And then you back all that up by doing the um, the whole survey side of things. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Now, there is one more question, and I might just ask you, Jeff, to actually type the answer 
um, in. Oh, okay. We are we are running slow, uh, running behind time. And there was one quick question around: uh, Are the videos going to be also available at the on the resource area on our website? Yes, that's why we're recording everything today. Um, we will have, you know, the entirety in its whole. But what we're also going to do is try and edit these so that we carve them up into um, digestible chunks of of, uh, of information for everybody. So again, those will be on our website. But for now, thank you so much, Jeff, for uh, those um, insightful presentation. There's so much there to pick up on. Uh, and we're going to do, I'm going to say a four minute bio break now. <laughs> we're going to come back at 10.25. There's about 113 people, by the way, who have turned up today. Uh, some are coming on and off given, uh, as I said, clashes with meetings, but amazing turnout, 113. Um, and yes, we'll see you back in four minutes. Um, and we see you, so do come back because there's heaps more to come, heaps more to come. See you in four minutes. Great. Now, the beauty with webinars is that you can still be making a cup of tea and coffee and listen, uh, because we have another fantastic uh, speaker uh, for you right now. So we're going to keep moving along. Uh, so thanks for, for hanging in there. And uh, as you all know, it's so much better to see this stuff live and to interact and ask your questions. 
um, you know, yes, we're gonna we're gonna put all the video up online, but uh, you'll you'll find it really hard to find this time again. So hang in there; it's gonna be great. Um, so right, so Denise uh, Busel, our senior manager, uh, research manager for Scarletti, is now here. Scarletti is a New Zealand research, analytics, and evaluation firm with extensive experience across a range of industry sectors, including horticulture. The Scarletti team apply their expertise to a wide range of projects requiring a high level of analysis and interpretation, and Denise leads Scarletti's extension program design work area, so perfect for today. Uh, her work also spans strategy facilitation and monitoring and evaluation. Denise has worked in the primary sector for over 25 years in many roles, including extension officer, facilitator, extension researcher, extension program designer, and evaluator. Extension, a tool for facilitating change, has been a constant in her work, as you can see. Denise believes that at the heart of any project is people, and understanding their response to change will help ensure that it will be effective. So without any further ado, I'm going to leave you, wonderful Denise, to take us through all your learnings. Thank you. <laughs> Kia ora, Liv. Uh, kia ora koutou. Ko Denise Tokoingoa. Thank you so much, Alida Touch, Gina and Liv and the team behind this webinar for the opportunity to get involved uh, uh, and um, be able to talk a bit about extension, which is uh, something that is a bit of a passion of mine and something that's been centre of my career since I started as an extension officer back in the mid-90s, uh, talking to growers about the need for water use efficiency, uh, to look at their irrigation practices, to help with uh, salinity management actually over in Victoria and Australia originally, uh, and yeah, getting getting to do lots of cool activities, doing soil pits, farm walks, uh, resource development, all of that kind of stuff, uh, really cool stuff. And um, learning from there uh, to most recently running the Action Network uh, Extension Program for Red Meat Profit Partnership, doing some evaluation and supporting the implementation of that and helping with facilitators of action groups and um, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, extension is cool. And I want today to be able to just give you a few principles that I think might be helpful when we're thinking about running effective extension programs. And I know many of you online, uh, many of the attendees have got some great experiences. So hopefully this kind of, um, yeah, it resonates with what you, you guys know, and maybe there's a couple of things that you can add in or pick up. And if you uh, yeah, are just starting, then hopefully this gives you a, a few tips to get, get uh, underway. So um, if we're talking about extension, uh, we do need to kind of start by going, well, what do we mean by extension? Because I know when I first started, had uh, yeah, got out there doing my job, I had friends go, so what are you doing again? And I'd start going, oh, I work in extension, da, da, da. And they'd look at me with this kind of very puzzled expression and go, but why are you doing verandas, house extensions? That That's a bit odd. Um, and I realized that everybody had a different view of extension. Um, so take a moment just to have a brief think. What do you think of? What's your definition? What's um, What do you think of when it comes to extension? So I'll just give you a moment to have a, a brief think about that. Hopefully you've had a chance just to gather your thoughts and jot, maybe jot a couple of things down. Um, for what it's worth, my one liner is that an extension is a tool for facilitating change on farm, on orchard, amongst landowners, whatever, whoever it is that you're working with here in Australia and in um, New Zealand, in this part of the world, we tend to think about uh, horticulture, growers, agriculture, that type of thing. But in other parts of the world, like uh, the US, they do have extension in all manner of different uh, different places. Um, everything from lawn management and home gardens and uh, home canning and bottling through to agriculture and horticulture. So, but here we tend to think of extension as something to do with uh, change on farm um, on, or on orchard. So important to keep that in mind, I think. 
uh, and also to bear in mind Extension's role. And I really loved um, hearing from Trevor and hearing what they did, that they actually, you know, got the social scientists involved and, and unpacked a little bit about what was going on, as well as doing all of the really cool research and trying to understand what was happening with the herbicide resistance. And then Jeff talking about understanding the farm context and who your actual um, audience is, you know, who are the potential adopters for a particular technology or innovation, because it really highlights the role that Extension has. Um, and if you heard what Jeff said, um, the role of Extension is to accelerate adoption by reducing the time and effort farmers must invest in learning. Now, I think that's really cool perspective and really quite helpful to understand um, that we're not increasing the um, number of adopters necessarily, because that's often beyond Extension's uh, uh, ability. You, you saw some of those things that influenced um, herbicide resistance and thinking, and some of them just weren't in growers' control. Some of them aren't in our control um, that Trevor showed. And then you heard what Jeff was talking about with farm context. Some of this isn't in uh, a grower or in our control. But what we can do is help reduce that time and effort to invest in learning and basically, um, yeah, reduce the risk of um, learning the wrong thing, finding out the wrong thing. So yeah, help, helpful, I think, to think about that's what Extension's role. And so what does Extension do? It's the fun stuff, non-formal education and learning activities um, for farmers, growers, producers, um, and others. Uh, so yeah, and we often do, like this is, this is why we get into Extension because it is really cool stuff. We get to get down soil pits, we get to run um, field days, we get to do all kinds of really cool things um, and get that engagement. We get to uh, hear what's going on, all of that good stuff. Um, but I think, yeah, we need to kind of balance it out with what we're, we're trying to do and have all of that in mind. So hopefully that's a bit helpful and kind of gives us a bit of a fundamental for what extension is and why, what we're really talking about. So my next question then is, uh, what does an effective extension program actually involve? Now, I know you've probably got some ideas. So I'm keen again, just to take a brief moment and get you to have a quick think and maybe jot down a couple of things that you think are important for an effective extension program. So take a moment, have a think, maybe jot something down. Now, if we weren't part of a webinar, I would be definitely there in front of you with chocolate because I believe chocolate is a very key extension tool. And I would be asking for feedback and I'd be hearing what you'd, you'd be saying and I'd be like, wow, we've got some great experience and thoughts in the room. I'd be handing you chocolate um, because of all of the great ideas and um, I'd hopefully be topping up what you were saying um, rather than telling you lots and lots of stuff that you already know. And we'd be learning from each other. That would be the ideal. Unfortunately, we're on a webinar, so, you know, you'll have to just think about chocolate, maybe, uh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I can't give you some, I haven't, haven't quite managed that uh, across a screen, but hopefully you've got a few ideas and thoughts. So, what does an effective extension program involve? I think it comes down to three things, and you've heard these hints in what Trevor was talking about, what Jeff was talking about, and you'll hear it again with Jim, so hopefully no surprise. Um, Three parts is understanding and documenting the change that's required. Understanding and documenting who your audience is, like who's actually needing to change, who are you wanting to change, who are you supporting? Because remember, extension is about for supporting and facilitating change. And then understanding and documenting the activities and the events which connect and support that change and the audience. Um, and I think, that as extensionists, we tend to fall into the trap of jumping straight to that third one because that's the fun stuff. It's really cool to do um, without actually thinking about hmm, what are we trying to achieve? Who are we trying to achieve it with? And then what will actually um, 
connect those two things. Uh, so uh, I think about, um, yeah, my first experience uh, with running an extension program, uh, working with growers, getting them to think about uh, irrigation management, soil, water, and nutrient management, basically. We're running really cool program, went really well. And then all of a sudden, it seemed like overnight it wasn't. Uh, and we actually got Jeff involved. That's when I first met Jeff many years ago. Uh, and we started doing uh, a bit of a project, basically using the technique that he he talked through. And we found out uh, from the research that we'd actually been mega successful with our extension program. We had, but we'd actually basically got to the end of the segment that we'd inadvertently been targeting because we actually hadn't written down <laughs> who our audience was. We'd said, Growers, all of these growers in this area are our target. Well, actually, it wasn't all of those growers. Um, and if we had taken the time to actually think about it, then and you know do some thinking, do some research, all of that kind of stuff, we would have actually realised that we'd been really successful. And now, if we we're going to do anything else, we needed to change what we were doing. So yeah, I I come back to that experience quite a lot because I feel like it kind of reinforces um, these principles and and what's uh, important when it comes to designing um, extension programs. So um, I thought to bring it all together, a couple of frameworks that might be helpful um, as we uh, think about it. So the first, oh yeah, so understanding the change required, firstly. Um, so understanding what that change looks like. There's some really useful frameworks out there, things like Bennett's Hierarchy, modified version of Bennett's CRISPs that I'm going to go through shortly. And then there's always, hey, workshop with the project team, chat to experts, having a chat to a few growers, understanding that you may not always get the whole picture, but at least you're going to get something rather than jumping out and going, oh, we know it's all good um, and off we go. So it's worth taking, yeah, whether you've got a lot of resource or a little bit of resource, it's worth making the time to understand what the change is needed, what the change looks like, what it's look, yeah, just finding out some stuff rather than making assumptions. So if we go for the structured and formal approach, Bennett's hierarchy is a framework that I really love. It's been around an extension for many, many years. Claude Bennett, the US Department of Agriculture, uh, put it together. Uh, he got naming rights because he came up with it. So hence Bennett's hierarchy. Um, and basically he was a little bit frustrated about how extension couldn't really demonstrate the impact that it was having. So he came up with this hierarchy to help evaluate things. Um, and what they've realized since then is actually it's really helpful for understanding and unpacking what you're trying to do. So I'm just going to flick through to look at Bennett's hierarchy because I think it's worth having a quick look. Um, some of you will be familiar with it. Others of you um, may not have heard of it, but basically it's like a ladder starting with, you can see at the bottom inputs going up to number seven uh, end results at the top. Um, and so what we uh, use Bennett's hierarchy for is you start at the top usually, you say, okay, well, what is the end result that we're actually aiming for? What's the big picture outcome of the change where we're really looking for? Therefore, what needs to be in place, what practice change needs to be in place for that to happen? Um, and we'll run through a bit of an example in a minute so you get a bit of a feel for that. Then it says, okay, if you've got the what practice changes are needed, well then what CASA change? Um, and by CASA, what we mean is what knowledge, attitude, skills, and aspirational change might need to be in place for that practice change to happen for you then to get your outcomes. Um, moving down the ladder, if you've got CASA change in place, what reactions are needed? Um, so that's level four. To get reactions, then you need people. Um, so who are the people that kind of talks to um, the next part of what we need to, to uh, work through, then what activities and the inputs. But it's really thinking about that top half of that framework that helps us unpack what we're really talking about. Because yeah, we can often kind of go be like, oh, we just we need to get everyone adopting um, integrated weed management. We need to understand um, integrated pest management, but we actually need often need to break it down to specific things like uh, mite management, like uh, um, 
downy mildew management. So actually being quite specific uh, rather than uh, keeping it at that general to be able to understand the change we're looking for. Um, so Bennett's just gives you a framework for thinking that and, and having a way of uh, a language to talk that process through and to understand what change um, you might be talking about. Uh, another framework which uh, is kind of a, a variation on um, Bennett's comes out of Western Australia. This is from CRISP. Uh, over, over in Western Australia, they did a whole lot of work uh, and basically kind of said, okay, well, how could we shortcut this a little bit um, and still get some useful information about what we're trying to achieve? Um, so they said, hey, um, if we start at improving uh, EES, so that's economic environment and social conditions, what does that look like? Then we talk about, well, what practice change needs to be in place. Then we talk about cast change. That sounds vaguely uh, not appropriate, but uh, what they're talking about is knowledge, understanding, and skills. Um, so what knowledge, understanding, and skills change needs to happen, and then what awareness might need to be in place for that change, um, practice change, and improved EES to occur. I don't really think it matters too much what framework you use. Um, the fact of having a framework gives you a language and a way of actually unpacking things. And I think that's the power of a framework. Um, so basically, you've probably got other change um, frameworks out there. You may have come across stuff. Use whatever makes sense to you, whatever is going to give you and your team uh, a language, a way of unpacking what the change um, you're talking about really is um, and unpacking it so that you're being very specific. Alrighty, looking at time, so I need to keep moving. I could obviously talk about this for way too long. Um, the next part is then, well, what about your audience, understanding your audience? And you've heard from Jeff about the really structured and formal approach for doing that. And I mean, it's gold standard, it's really good stuff. Um, we did that to kind of understand why, what we thought would gone wrong, um, uh, the experience I mentioned before, um, but you could use the questions, like, you know, just even doing some interviewing and asking and listening and trying to cover a range of growers, as Jeff talked about, from those that are doing something, those that, aren't doing something to those that might have tried and abandoned it, disadopted it, um, just to try and get an understanding. So you don't have to have heaps of resources, but putting some resource into understanding your audience, asking and listening is going to, yeah, just get you a heap further than if you, um, yeah, just assume that you know. Um, and yeah, you may know, but it's worth checking. It's always worth checking. So, um, and then all of the extension activities flow out from that and mapping, if you've got understanding that change, you've got your audience in mind, then mapping out your activities really kind of falls into place after that. And then if funders or others are challenging you about why you're doing something, you can actually show you know, the logic of why you're doing things. It also then gives you a way of monitoring and evaluating what you're doing because you've you, you've actually documented, you know, what the changes, who your audience is, what the activities are, and you've got points that you can evaluate um, as part of that. So I think it's worth going through this type of process, um, not only to ensure that you've got an effective extension program, but also to demonstrate that you've actually got an effective extension program. Um, so I thought I should take something and just like do a little bit of an example. And so I went onto the Lighter Touch website and apologies if anyone is online and I am completely speaking out of turn on the Biodiverse Planting in Perennial Crops project, which I saw had been completed on the uh, Lighter Touch website. Um, it was really fascinating. They were getting, um, yeah, biodiverse planting in the interrows and in citrus it looked like uh, in the first instance in perennial crops and trying to understand, you know, the good, uh, what was working, what wasn't working and promote that idea. Um, and so I started thinking about this process and thinking about what it would look like um, if we were designing then an extension program based on that research work um, and obviously the feedback from the growers that were involved in all of that research because it's all really helpful. So um, if your big outcome is biodiverse planting in perennial crops, that's what you'd really like to see, then let's break it down. What kind of changes 
might you need to practice changes might you need to see and when I started going into that project there were some cool little videos and one of them started talking about well we need to actually do some crop monitoring because that's actually really important to understand what beneficials you have what the pest pressure is um, so you're understanding what's going on and I went oh so actually maybe it's Yes, the outcome is the biodiverse planting, but maybe one of the practice changes we're actually trying to target in, the, in an extension program would be increasing the use of crop monitoring. Now, now I'm going to go completely you know, into unknown territory and make some assumptions myself, but based on what you heard from Tre Trevor and, um, and Jeff, then I'm thinking that maybe initially a target audience would be growers in regions where pest pressure is low, where they have the opportunity to actually try out some of these things, understand what pest pressure they have, what where the hotspots are, what beneficials, be able to encourage the beneficials, that kind of thing, because they'll be able to play with it. And they may have been the ones that were initially interested in the research project because they could have done, you know, because they were in a position to be able to take advantage of this. There could be others who are interested in finding out more about crop monitoring and understanding what's going on in their um, in their crops. So yeah, that's a bit of a starting point to start saying, well, that's who I think our audience would be. And then we could say, well, what kind of activities would we really need to connect that change and uptake of crop monitoring with those target audiences? And I started going, just doing a bit of brainstorm, um, nothing that you probably haven't already thought of, but things like practical workshops around identifying what is beneficial because, hey, it's an insect, you know, many growers will, will know some of them, um, identifying which are good, which are bad, all of that kind of stuff, um, fitting crop monitoring into routine orchard work. I think would be a really critical thing because you often don't want to add time burdens. People are under time constraints. So quite important to kind of think through that, how, you know, what kind of activities could demonstrate that. And then, hey, there's lots of different places to get online resources. So what kind of resources, backups would you need so that they can, you know, oh, I quickly need to just double check that I'm identifying that um, beneficial right. Have I got something on my phone that I can, that can, I can pull up a, a ute guide, whatever it might be. Um, so you can start to see that we're documenting, um, yeah, what's going on um, and, and basically you'll start to outline your extension program and start outlining where you might want to evaluate things along the way. Um, so hopefully that just gives you a little bit of an example um, of applying those three principles of understanding the change you're acquiring, understanding your audience, and then linking uh, activities to those two things um, to be able to show that you're actually achieving what you want to achieve. Uh, in the slides that will be made available, I have put links to all of those uh, Bennett's and planning frameworks. Uh, there's also a couple of other resources that I wanted to highlight, the enablers of change resources. I know some of you are probably already over all over that, um, but just to highlight that there are some really good resources out there. Um, make use of them. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, yeah, so uh, Liv, thank you so much. That was where I was going to leave it, conscious of time, and I should finish up there. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Denise. There's so much to go into in that uh, in that presentation. I was just taking notes. And to be honest, from a lighter touch perspective, well done. Can you do everything else that we've completed <laughs> as well? No, you guys just are doing awesome ahead. stuff. Do, do extensions for all of our programs of work. <laughs> Excellent. No problems. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, there was one um, one thing that did spark my interest, and that was the whole target audience piece. And I know obviously from my my previous work, that when you actually say to somebody, no, you really need to focus on the exact target audience you're looking at. Is it a him or a her? Is it what do they look like, smell like, all that sort of stuff and really bring it down. People get very, very nervous because they're like, oh, no, 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 but we need everybody to understand it. You know, I mean, my briefs were always all New Zealanders aged <laughs> 30 to 80 and you're like, what are you trying yeah. to get at? So how do you help people narrow that thinking and get them out of that fear of missing out on certain growers or farmers? Um, well, I think I think that comes down to thinking through, um, well, there's a couple of things. It's being able to demonstrate progress and um, and show, yeah, which is linked to showing the impact. And so instead of 
trying to eat the whole elephant, let's actually show that we can really bite off that leg and do yeah. that well. Um, so for me, it's not you're not necessarily saying that you'll never get to everybody, um, but you're saying let's start with where it makes sense and the ones that are ready to go. They want this information. They're looking for it. You know that kind of thing. So they're leaning. They're leaning yeah. forward already. Yeah, grabbing. exactly. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. 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 Um, got another question, but just a reminder to pop your question. I know there was so much information in Denise's piece and everyone's probably digesting, but don't forget to, you've got her. <laughs> so just pop the questions in. Um, here's your next one. Uh, so re-identifying audiences via IV or uh, quick and dirty processes. I can see how this identifies the characteristics of your potential adopters or audience, but how do you actually identify them as individuals to target? So similar. Or do you target your approach around, are you worried about this? Have you considered that? Uh, come talk to us because we can help. How is uh, that? And, and I think, Anna, yeah. you are so onto it. Um, FAR is doing awesome stuff in this space. And that is exactly it. It's not that you, and, and I have to credit Jeff for this as well. Very early on, he went, it's just about signaling that you know what they need it's mm -hmm. not about that you need to identify that person you know farmer grower along you know this road those three growers and the growers along that road um you know we don't interested in it's about signaling hey we understand what you're actually after and so it's it's putting out that it, you know are you worried about exactly like you said Anna are you worried about have you considered this come talk to us because have we got a deal for you um so <laughs> that is really what it's all about you're demonstrating that you understand the need and they will they'll self-select Jeff talks a lot about self-selection that's really what you want you want to be able to provide the detail so people growers self-select they go oh yeah th they understand what I'm after I'm after yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, can these frameworks be used after delivery? Are there any supplementary post-delivery frameworks you would suggest? Um, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a little bit biased because I, I love these frameworks. I think they're really useful. Um, and I do think that they could be used after delivery if you're wanting to assess what was going on, if you're wanting to figure out maybe where the gaps are, where you might want to um, think about the next kind of iteration of your extension program, that kind of thing. So I think absolutely. Are there any post-delivery frameworks I'd suggest? Um, uh, there, there's a number out there, uh, any of, like I said, any of the change frameworks, understanding any theory of change frameworks would be useful in this. Choose one, get to know it, understand how it works and use it and let it become a common language in your team so that you can have the conversations, you can ask the questions of each other, you can challenge and figure out, oh, was that a gap or were they actually not part of our audience? You know, do we not have to worry about them? That kind of thing. So, yeah, yeah. no, I completely agree. And I think using that model uh, post the delivery is critical to actually review because <laughs> yes, as, yeah. as I said, right at the beginning, it's not a one hit wonder. This is a nudge that's going to take time. So that'll actually, I'm assuming, help you understand where you know where are we still missing the mark is it reach or is it understanding their emotions or yeah so monitoring and evaluation essentially yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and monitoring and evaluation I think is crucial and as extension people we're generally pretty poor at it because we're too busy doing stuff and it's really exciting <laughs> but actually doing some monitoring and evaluation is really helpful so awesome yeah. awesome um how does the Bennett framework differ from a logic model or are they very similar yeah basically Bennett's is a logic framework is a uh, and there are a number out there um so yeah uh Bennett's framework logic model I think they're fairly similar so okay. yeah great um choosing the right delivery method or methods often we are driven towards digital media suits some but not others how do you go about finding the right mix <laughs> yes. Uh, well, <laughs> I think this then comes back to monitoring and evaluation that you actually you've thought about who you're trying to target, what the changes that you're requiring, and when you're then putting out a social media campaign or you're doing um, some social media resource or uh, online resources, there's actually some monitoring that's in behind that so that you're going, oh, that didn't go off as much as I thought. Okay, was that the right, wrong timing? You know, was it the actually the wrong audience I, or I didn't signal what we were actually selling, you know, well enough um, mm -hmm. so that you can actually assess that. So I think um, 
I think monitoring and evaluation just has to be in the mix if you're gonna if you're gonna do it because you're never gonna get it right first time as I think you can't expect to get it you know spot on. Um, I also come back to Frank Van Clay's uh, the best extension method is multiple extension methods. Um, Frank Van Clay's from Australia originally written extensively done heaps of research in this extension space and that's his line. Best extension method is multiple extension methods. So there's no silver bullets. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, in the in the old world, in the advertising world, it was seven times in seven different ways. Yes. And yep. they'll actually start to understand what's going on. <laughs> so yeah, well, keep, keep at it. We are the same. We're all human here. Farmers yeah. are humans yeah. that farm. So yeah. you know, we are just yeah. keep keep yeah. hammering in different ways. That's um, right. last question then I might ask you as well to type it out just in terms of uh, time, but last uh, verbal question, does a self-selection approach to identifying participants risk essentially preaching to the converted? Good question. I.e. those who would find a solution without assistance? Uh, the short answer is yes, it, that is a risk. Um, the longer answer is that that's extension's role. We're there to reduce the risk and, and reduce the time that it actually does take so that things can happen faster. So the the, the pool of potential adopters who were going to do this, who were thinking that, you know, maybe this was a good idea or what, maybe weren't aware of it, but their conditions are right, um, will be like, oh, yeah, and it actually will, will occur quicker. That's extension's role. So I don't necessarily see that as a contradiction. I think that is a, an excellent thing. Um, yeah. And then it's your know, monitoring and evaluation to check uh, how things are actually going. Um, it's probably talking to uh, people who talk to growers that you don't normally see. So that would be another way that I would suggest, um, you know, thinking about monitoring and evaluating is how do you hear from people that you don't usually see? And often it's connecting with the people that they do connect with. Um, yeah. So how can you get feedback like that? Word of mouth. Yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. Well, in, in terms of monitoring and evaluating, that is the question that if I could get you to type away, which is how no best worries. to monitor and evaluate, that would be <laughs> fabulous. Yep. And so we can uh, thank you so much, Denise. There's so much there. Uh, and I'm sure our our participants are fizzing with a lot in their brain. So thank you again. And we'll see you shortly as well on the panel. Um, and we now welcome our final, but definitely lot, not least uh, presenter here today, uh, Dr. Jim Walker, who probably does not need an introduction to be frank, but I will introduce you, Jim, uh, anyway, principal scientist at Plant and Food Research. So over his 45 year career, Jim has driven significant change in the horticulture sector, using his scientific expertise to develop innovative tools and techniques for managing pests and diseases, which have helped position Aotearoa New Zealand as a competitive and top quality fruit growing nation. Jim is well known for his role in the development and implementation of the Integrated Fruit Production Program, an approach to pest management that has become a cornerstone of New Zealand's apple export program. This program prioritized greater use of biological control and non-chemical methods and has contributed to a 90% reduction in the quantity of insecticide used in New Zealand apple productions today. Talk about a lighter touch, my goodness. Um, Jim was also instrumental in the next generation in orchard management, the Apple Futures Program. So without further ado, Jim, I'm going to hand over to you for our final and fabulous uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Liv. And uh, thank you to the Light of Touch program for giving me this opportunity to speak to you today. So yes, uh, my presentation is really from innovation to implementation, and it really covers a 20-year journey uh, from what we call the IFP program or the Integrated Fruit Production Program uh, through to the Apple Futures program. So a little bit of background first and factors uh, driving our export programs. The industry is around 940 orchards, 10,000 hectares, 600,000 tonnes. 90% of the class one apples are exported and it earns about $900 million in export revenue. If you're thinking about the export drivers, it's a small domestic market. And a really important point here is that two thirds of the cost are past the orchard gate. So it's a really important industry. You've got to have premium export markets. You've got to have innovation and new cultivars, productivity and sustainability. You've got to do all of those things because we need to get a 30% premium to offset our high cost of 
not only production, but our distance from market. If we think at the, of the journey over this time frame, um, pre-1996, we had calendar crop protection systems in place. That was largely mandated by ENSA at the time in order to meet the quarantine requirements. Uh, this was a and became a, a very unpopular program with the uh, apple growers at the time, who were sort of locked into uh, repeated uh, use of uh, calendar spraying, highly toxic insecticides. The journey uh, over this time has been from responsible use, bringing in these monitoring systems that I'll talk about shortly with IFP, through global gap uh, programs, and then the industry positioning itself towards residue free. It's really important to note that the export focus, we're shipping fruit to about 70 countries. We've got to be near pest and disease free in order to not have quarantine issues. And we need to be near residue free. And we're going to do this all out of the same uh, apple crop production system. Uh, different sizes go to different markets. Just looking at this timeline here along the bottom, uh, the Integrated Fruit Production Program was largely introduced in response to Tesco's in the UK demanding that we change our way of uh, fruit production. And so that was the initial driver. It was introduced in a time of great change uh, through the industry. There was deregulation of the apple industry uh, in 2001. That was a tough time. Uh, we went from one exporter to 86 exporters. Uh, the profits plummeted uh, to 19 point, negative 19.5%. So all of this was introduced in a very difficult time. The Apple Futures program was introduced in 2009, which just happened to coincide with the global financial crisis. So it's been a, a journey of change through very difficult times for the industry. And uh, then the Apple Futures program uh, coming through uh, as a marketing program in 2011. Uh, the uh, UK supermarket uh, assurance programs drove everything, at least initially. Then the EU regulatory environment and supermarket restrictions on pesticides kicked in during the period from 2007 uh, and has continued. The more recent focus has been Asian market profitability and growth, uh, but I'm not really going to talk about those today. If you think about the uh, IFP program in apples, the production drivers in 1995, nobody liked the intensity of spraying that was going on at the time. We had insecticide resistance uh, to the leaf rollers, the mealy bugs. Uh, we were using, uh, making extensive use of organophosphate insecticides and there was extreme insecticide toxicity in that environment. No growers liked the repeated use and their blood tests that they had to do every year. So in terms of worker safety and environmental toxicity, there was a big loading at the time. But despite that intensity of use, we were getting more than 18% market closure uh, through to pests, largely through uh, resistance that had developed. So there was a, a willingness on the part of the industry to look at change. Change needed to happen. And the vision that we had at the time which was based on a really a lot of historical knowledge that we had about the potential for biological control, was a future with responsible insecticide use and a deep redesign of the entire apple crop protection system. So we had a clearly identifiable objective with the program. It was a whole of industry objective, sustainable production uh, using the safest possible methods uh, for the environment and human health. We really set about at that time to identify the team building exercise that we needed. Uh, Co-leadership was uh, with ENSA and uh, some of us within Hort Research at that time. We had identified the sector stakeholders that we needed to bring along with us, uh, members of AGCAM uh, around uh, the supply of new pesticides, but uh, also farmlands, fruit fed, the supply groups. Uh, but also the consultants, the likes of uh, Ag First, and uh, certainly we had the involvement of the Pesticide Action Network of New Zealand, 
our preliminary discussions in that with Greenpeace didn't go that well, but we felt that we had good community engagement through uh, uh, representatives from Pesticide Action Network. And importantly, we had leading growers involved in that initial team building program. We uh, set about uh, to set up at the time uh, the New Zealand Pip Fruit Integrated Fruit Production Committee. And uh, with ENSA, Hort Research, the various sector groups and growers involved, we had a whole number of different technical subcommittees because this was a deep redesign of the entire approach to crop protection. So I'm only really going to be talking about pests uh, today, uh, but clearly what we went through and identified was the IFP standards, that those were our goals in each one of these subcommittees. We produced IFP documents and designed an implementation program. So for pests, and I'm just going to talk about the pest component today to eliminate the ecotoxic OP insecticides, only justified pesticide use, so get away from calendar spraying, and then maximize our, our use of biocontrol. And I want to emphasize maximize biocontrol. That was really an important point. And ultimately to reduce our quarantine failures that we were experiencing, uh, particularly when it came to North American exports. We just had to write everything down in 1996 and we produced this uh, wonderful manual, but it was like a book, uh, like an all stop really. And um, there was a lot of information in there, but subsequently we refined that through to a website where most of the information is now contained and readily accessible to all growers, and then simplified things down to ultimately a wall chart. And uh, that's an annual updating process that takes place today. In terms of implementation, we identified the ag chem industry as important in there. The merchant suppliers, after all, the merchant suppliers see growers more often than what we would as, as, as researchers, and uh, then also consultants. Uh, but then the input from growers uh, themselves is really important. Implementation happened uh, during uh, or began in 1996 and was complete by 2001. And it was really important that we set this timeline because we had a pretty good idea that the industry was going to be deregulated in 2001 and we would lose that control. We'd identified some soft new technologies. There was one particular uh, product, uh, Mimic, uh, as a selective pesticide, which could be the, a new platform on which to have and include biocontrol. We introduced new monitoring systems. Growers had never monitored for pests before. It was always just calendar spraying, uh, pheromone traps. And then later we started to introduce the non-chemical uh, control systems such as uh, mating disruption. In terms of stakeholder engagement, that was really important. Uh, in terms of having ag chem industry forums, we needed to signal the changes and we need to plan for changes. It was really important because we had to manage uh, the crop and the risks to the entire export program. We involved the merchants and consultants. We uh, set about with training programs on pest identification so they knew what they were looking at and were competent in identifying uh, things. New crop monitoring services uh, emerged as an offset to the reduction in some of the pesticide use that followed. Discussion groups were really important and we chose a discussion group model, each being up to about 15 to 20 growers maximum. We had three meetings per year and at the full speed ahead uh, part of the program, we had up to about 75 of those groups operating around the country. Key uh, to that was a facilitator. That was the trusted relationship that they already had with their consultant. And uh, then we contributed uh, from a team of people that were involved in either research or technology and some part of the program uh, along that journey. In terms of uh, IFP adoption nationally, I think it's really important that you look at this graph here. The first start of the program in 1996 was incentivized. And, and you could do that under the ENSA uh, model. And it was just 25 cents a, a carton of, of apples to be an IFP grower. And that largely offset the additional costs of your monitoring system, your pheromone traps. To get the laggards on board in the end, in the final year, 
uh, that changed to a 75 cent deduction for those people who hadn't uh, got or made the effort uh, to get through to becoming an integrated fruit production orchard. So you can see a fairly rapid pace of an option. And uh, yeah, it was a highly managed process and a lot of uh, discussion and input uh, with growers during this time. Continuous improvement of the IFP recommendations. And I really want to stress here the importance of feedback loops. There were grower issues. We need to, to understand their tolerance of risk. This is a highly risky crop protection uh, and production system. Understand their issues and concerns with respect to disease, uh, outbreaks of black spot or coddling moth, which could get them kicked out of market. And we need to come up with a way to accept and address these issues and modify the recommendations accordingly. All through this process, we made sure that uh, we had access to grower records, the pheromone trap records, the spray diary data, which was freely shared with us, analysis systems. We looked at fruit quality in the pack house. We looked at pest incidents and then rapidly incorporated this through into the program. So the program issues for us were really crop risk management was central, maintaining confidence in the program, and underpinning that was the integrity of the grower data. So we needed to get access to, to their data and their honest records and growers' willingness to share that data. So a lot of it actually came back to, to trust. It was a whole industry data for continuous improvement and refinement of the program as we went through that uh, five to six year period. If we look at the integrated fruit production program in terms of sector-wide, long-term insecticide use, this is a, a, I'm identifying it, I've, I've focused on the period through to 2005. By the time we got through to 2005, we had essentially eliminated all of the highly toxic broad spectrum insecticide organophosphate use and uh, largely replaced that with selective uh, insecticides. And uh, in doing so, the insecticide frequency, that's the frequency of applications, reduced by somewhere between 50 and 60%. Selective insecticides favored the natural enemies. So we have maximized our biological control by eliminating the OP disruption. And we saw and growers saw, and that was really important, that some of their previously important pests, the two most important groups that were causing failures, the meaty bugs and, and the leaf rollers had declined. So that was a, a major way of actually seeing benefit and seeing outcomes that helped to reinforce those drivers. The part that's slightly ghosted there is just to show you that this has been an enduring program and the, that change continued uh, beyond the IFP program. If you think of the pest management outcomes and the, some of the other IFP bonuses that there were, was the huge reduction in uh, toxicity in terms of moving away from the highly toxic organophosphate insecticides. The total loading per hectare fell from around 14 kilograms, and that trend continued all the way through to 2015, where basically at that time we were now using about 1.5 kilograms of insecticide per season, but importantly, they were benign insecticides, soft and maximized biocontrol. Through this whole period, you can see the fall off in the inspection failure rate. So we had continuously improving performance uh, at the same time because we were maximizing biological control and integrating uh, the soft and selective insecticides. So that was a really important thing. So it helped to reinforce uh, the whole grower adoption uh, of the program. By 2005, yes, we had achieved uh, the uh, and got rid of the highly toxic and ecotoxic insecticides within our program and really had brought about a complete uh, refocus of growers' awareness on the importance of biocontrol. It was not just biocontrol, it was a safer uh, orchard, better orchard environment, a safer working environment. No more blood tests for their organophosphate spraying. Um, but there was an emerging uh, EU focus on, on residues uh, that was had to be dealt with. 
And uh, basically the comment in that from the industry at this time, we can't continue to live with the residue issues. We need to have a universally marketable apple. And so the journey continued to now focus on how we could be the world's best in terms of the lowest possible residues. So the Apple Futures program was the next two EU and regulatory challenge that the industry faced. And this program, Apple Futures, ran from 2006 to 2010. It started with a pilot program uh, and it again now required a new level of access and that was to sector residue tests. So all of our fruit residue tests. And the program set about targeting the persistent uh, agrochemicals, those that were still on the fruit or at harvest. And again, uh, with the aim of producing export quality fruit with the lowest possible residues while managing managing all of those risks. And by the time we got to that, after the experience of the IFP program, the growers' attitude had changed. Yes, we can do it. And we look, they actually embraced the challenge that lay ahead of them. They wanted to differentiate their product to realize market premiums. So then we had the uh, Apple Futures program. Again, we had clearly articulated goal, production of low residue apples while meeting the phytosanitary requirements of over 65 countries. This was a national uh, program that rolled out. Some of the features of that product, of that program were product selection based on decay curves, hundreds of residue tests, establishing new withholding periods, and a target for all residues of zero or up to 10% of the EU allowable residue. And remember, if we achieve this, this was going to facilitate better access for all of the fruit out of the orchard, the small fruit, the big fruit, it kept that market flexibility. Apple Futures adoption. This is just showing you how quickly the program uh, became adopted because largely because of the success of the IFP program that preceded it. So it built on success. And we were substantially oversubscribed. We had to turn down growers. We had 390 who wanted to join the program in Hawke's Bay alone that season. And we could really only com accommodate up to about 80 uh, in Hawke's Bay. Apple Futures by the final year, which was the end of the global financial crisis, we had um, achieved all residues at or below 10% of the EU MRL. Fully no insecticide residues on 65% of the export crop. Fungicide residues were commonly detected, but ultra low. Mostly no more than zero to two fungicide residues per crop. And by that time, what we had now in place was a, uh, a national random residue testing program that uh, growers subscribe to. In terms of the economic benefit, and this is an NZIER assessment. It helped protect our pr premium market position in Europe. It added approximately 10% to our export returns per annum over three years. And in terms of the cost of the implementation program, it was roughly a 30 to one return on investment uh, in terms of the implementation process that we rolled out. If we look at the program and the Apple uh, IFP program and Apple Futures, it was a deep redesign of the entire Apple crop protection system. It has continued and uh, through innovations, we've mating disruption has come in, greater use of biological insecticides. This has been a, a long journey, but you know, growers have bought into the whole uh, program. In terms of international recognition, it's always better if you can get somebody else to blow your own trumpet. And, you know, this is uh, uh, out of um, uh, USDA uh, residue sampling testing. New Zealand has the fewest residues on their fruit and uh, by a factor of 30 fold, the lowest dietary risk. And for EPA uh, in the US to sort of state that uh, the highest risk apples, uh, highest residue risk on Chilean apples, while New Zealand apples had very few residues and only posed a slightly higher risk than organic apples. It's much better if you've got somebody else saying that it's a great marketing position for your industry to be in. 
just um, in closing, this slide is really just trying to identify success uh, in the Apple IFP program and really understanding the uh, what led to success. It was a market imperative, and that gave us a big advantage. We'd had a lot of prior research that had sort of almost gone nowhere, but was sitting up on the shelf waiting for this opportunity. But it was really important to setting an achievable goal and timeline and getting growers on board that there were some rewards and incentives in the process. The vision it was uh, responsive to customers, what our customers were demanding. IFP's philosophical appeal to growers, safer orchard environment and maximizing the use of biocontrol. In a way, it was future-proofing the sector from a whole raft of other changes that uh, came along. And grower attitudes, we can do it. I, I think a lot of things around leadership was that confidence in the leadership. Um, Getting off to a good start was really important. Managing risk and uh, acknowledging your mistakes was really important. It was a science-led innovation. It did create a, a sense of excitement and, and change. There were new concepts and new technology, mating disruption, pheromone traps, monitoring systems. Growers actually knew what their, their targets looked like, their pest targets. It had multiple and ongoing innovation happening. Trust was really important, trust in the leadership for the program. Uh, without trust, you've got nothing. So, um, you know, trust, I can't emphasize that enough. You know, we had access to data and confidential and sensitive data, but using that data wisely and for the benefit of, of all growers was really important. In terms of participation, discussion group format worked really well. Social support, learning by, by example and learning from each other. And certainly that was a two-way process. The pilot test programs were important for us. We had to de-risk uh, what was, uh, in effect, a quite a risky program. And we had to acknowledge and manage those risks and uncertainty throughout. In terms of... Uh, making sure that there was always support available, expert advice. We had responsive Q&A &Q systems. Uh, we had direct science facilitator grower interactions. There was a lot of that. I spent a lot of time, not just me, but many others out there working with growers, answering questions when difficulties arose, facing up when problems arose, and um, accepting responsibility was really important. And uh, the, one of the real reasons that it was succeeded was that fixed the resistance and export failure problem. What it did do was to take a crisis that Tesco's presented us with uh, in the 1995 and turned it into an opportunity, a marketing opportunity that was recognized even, uh, as said, by uh, US uh, EPA. We've built on IFP successes, so IFP in many ways actually catalyzed Apple Futures. And the highlight, I guess, of this program is that grower pride in their achievements and grower ownership of IFP. And one of the first questions today when any new product arrives in the Apple industry is, will it affect my biocontrol? Will it disrupt my system? And, and that's uh, really a big part of the success it's a grower-owned program. Growers have bought into this, and it's fundamentally changed Apple IPM uh, for the foreseeable future. And uh, with that, I'd like to say thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to talk to you all today. Oh, thank you so much, Jim. I've heard so much about the uh, the immense change that you've done, and I saw for over 20 years. So this is not a overnight overnight success it's sustained um and simply simply incredible to be honest i um i was thinking about that graph around uh you know you used incentives and carrot and stick basically at one point for those industry groups that potentially can't have that type of incentive you know what what would be your approach you think it would be harder for them to do the changes that you're talking about without the incentive or the stick no, I think that uh, we would have got there anyway. It might have taken a little bit longer, but we were aware of industry deregulation as being an inevitability, and we needed to get 
everybody on board. But but everybody who started down this journey within the space of two seasons, perhaps in some instances three seasons, they could start to see benefits. So the benefit of biocontrol, reducing their meaty bug problem, reducing their leaf roller problem was immensely important. So word of mouth, but getting growers along in those discussion groups, all of a sudden it switched. By the time the industry was deregulated in 2001, and there were a few orchards on the market at that time, growers were actually using this in their advertising to say their orchard had been IFP for two years, three years, or four years. So they were seeing this as a value add uh, to their to their business. And even if they were getting out of the business, it was still a value add to the, the sale of the property. Sale of property, which is amazing. There's a there's a question in a similar in similar vein uh, as well. You mentioned 25 cents extra per tray was enough to offset cost of change. How big do you think this was in adoption compared to grow a desire for change? So that 25 cents, did that really help move it or was it more of a desire no the desire was there nobody wanted to be doing what they were doing you know previously and there was a, a deep uh, sense of um i i don't know growers were really annoyed with uh what enza was mandating uh, at the time and they wanted change and this was an opportunity for change the 25 cents was a nice little carrot but it's, they didn't need that. After the first uh, early adopters that got into the program and started to talk about it, uh, then it, it gathered its own momentum. Fantastic. Uh, I've got one here. Um, hi, Jim. The summer fruit and pip fruit sectors are closely aligned and often even the same growers involved, yet their IPM journeys have been quite different. So here's the exam question. Thinking about extension regimes, can you compare and contrast some key points you've observed in those journeys? Yeah, um, I think a lot of it actually comes down to the amount of resource that you've got, the size of the industry, and I guess having a common vision. So, yes, it hasn't been as successful in the summer fruit industry. There's no reason why it could not be mm. as successful in the summer fruit industry. I think it really comes down to the fact that we've got different drivers in the summer fruit industry. The North Island summer fruit industry is strongly focused on uh, domestic market and the South Island industry fo strongly focused on export. So there's slightly different approaches to what they want to do and how they manage their risk. Some of the changes have been implemented in summer fruit, but it's a little bit more complicated because of that. Um, it's not a, a totally export driven model. Okay. No, it makes sense. Makes sense. Do you have views on the value of commercial technology companies in working with growers and researchers to scale technology adoption? Yeah, um, you know, certainly I think that what this whole program has done has put and did for, for a long period there put New Zealand at the forefront of a lot of change. And uh, I think... Um, rather than seeing uh, this as a threat to the whole, say, of the agrochemical crop protection environment, we actually had contact with a lot of people who were interested in what was actually happening in New Zealand as being a forerunner for change that was ultimately going to affect other producers and other markets and other crops. So it, in a way, it actually facilitated conversations and put us in a, in a position where we had opportunities to meet with quite high level people around in, in, in that whole uh, crop protection uh, space around future directions. Brilliant. And continues to do so, I'm sure, mm -hmm. as well. Um, so look, Jim, I think your talk has been incredible. Um, we've just about running out of time because I was meant to hold, so you're going to stay there. I was meant to hold 40 minutes for our panel discussion. So again, thank you so much for, uh, you know, sharing your story and the journey uh, that apples have been on, which is an inspiration, I know, to many other uh, crops here in New Zealand, looking, looking at what you've achieved there. So a lot to learn from. Um, but now we are not going to do a bio break. What I'm going to ask is that if anyone does need a bio break, because it's a webinar, you can take us and keep listening. And that's okay, because we can't hear you. 
which is the main thing, right? So, so we will continue on because we've got half an hour with these amazing brains in the room and it's been really tough to keep on time because there's so much knowledge that they're wanting to share and I didn't want to stop that flow. So we are going to move on. So by all means, take your bio break or make another cup of coffee if you need it. But I'm going to roll on to um, the really exciting part of our um, panel or webinar today, which is the panelists. So we asked when you registered, if you could um, give us a question that you'd like to ask the panel to uh, input into. We had a huge response, you know, uh, to this and actually took us quite a bit of time to sort out who, um, you know, what what questions we'd like to answer. And there, and we've summarized a few of them because there were quite a few that were very, very similar in the similar ilk. So hopefully these will um, nail a few for you. So first one, here we go. IPM has been around for many years and implemented successfully in crops such as apples. Clearly we've seen that. Uptake in vegetables, though, is variable. We have resources and manuals, New Zealand-based expertise in this area. How do we effectively communicate and facilitate uptake of IPM across the vast range of crop types and geographical spread of vegetable crops? Jim, I might throw to you. I'm just going to throw. <laughs> Unpracticed, but given that question, I might throw to you first, and then everybody from the panel can jump in as they wish when they can add a few things. It's, it's very difficult if you haven't got some focus to your program. For us, you know, I think it's been relatively easy and straightforward because we had the coordination and a, and a coordinated export industry. But when you come to identifying the value proposition and the drivers to make and embrace change is actually quite difficult. And we, I guess, have tried, I guess, to some extent through branding to identify how our product is different. But if there's no value proposition there, if there's no driver, it's actually very, very difficult. And is the market demanding that change? Change is often really only going to come about if the market sends clear signals for change. If you haven't got that, then I think some of it's people don't perceive there to be a problem until they become aware of it. Yeah, absolutely. Other panelists jumping in, more thoughts? I would just like to add um, for weeds and it's probably the same for other things, having a stationary crop and a movable crop are a big difference. So apples, you've got it there, it's permanent and you've got plenty of time to implement it. If you're in horticulture and, and cropping of vegetables and that sort of thing, you're, you know, you're responding to demand, you're responding to season, uh, you're responding to your crop rotation or what you expect, and therefore it's a much more difficult uh, situation to implement and probably needs uh, more research to, to get it established and to get continuity across that sort of environment. Yeah, that's a really good point, Trevor. The, um, the annual ecosystem is very different to the enduring orchard system where you live and that with your biocontrol <clears throat> resident within your orchard and you're trying to manage that. The annual cropping system is, is very different in terms of the amount of ecosystem disruption that's potentially happening. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I think I think the comparison is lovely between things like summer fruit and apples. And the fact that you've got the same grower using completely different management techniques, it highlights the fact that it's the differences in the production system for the different types of crops that's driving what's going on. Um, and the fact that like in apples, you had a market imperative, which is effectively like a regulation banning you from using a particular technique. Mm. So if you don't have that in other in your other industries, then there isn't that incentive or that imperative to change. And then you bring in on top of that, the differences in the, um, in the production systems. And, and so you get differences in, in adoption rates, which means it's very important to look at say something like vegetables and not assume that it's failure. 
It's just the lack of consistency of some of the techniques with the uh, context that the growers are operating in. Yeah. Denise, would you like to add? I can't add anything. I endorse what you or each of the panelists have been saying. Um, uh, from an extension point of view, maybe your extension program isn't actually targeted at growers. It's targeted at a change in other think other people's thinking. It could be amongst uh, resellers, uh, amongst uh, policymakers. That could be actually your extension program if you're really serious about this change that needs to be done, um, that needs to be put in place. But maybe growers aren't your first port of call as an extension program. Take it, take it up the up the ladder. Yep. But I'm just wondering, have we, you know, we've sort of um, discussed. Yes, it's hard, and in particular with different types of crops and vegetable crops, are, uh, you know, enduring versus not enduring. But I'm wondering if we've actually asked answer the question, which is, do we have how would we effectively communicate in this space uh, against different crop types and geographical areas? Are there any hints, you know, even like you were saying before, Jim, you know, you've got the, the north and the south with respect to the, the fruit um, and the orchards. Is there anything that you guys would do differently geographically or with different crops? Or does that depend on a myriad of different things, I'm sure? Yeah, it is kind of interesting because, I mean, if you look at summer fruit industry just while we're on that you know yeah. they do have a summer green program they do have a, a, a soft option uh there and open to them it really actually does come down to some of the industries embraced it and, and probably some of the industry has fought against it uh you know they haven't they haven't been consistent and they haven't really probably seen the same benefit overall benefit from the what i would call the partial implementation mm. of an IFP type program. They've, it's one of those things if you're half pregnant, you know, I mean, you can't go and retain organophosphates in your system because, uh, you know, they are, we, we create biological deserts every time we use them. Yeah. And, you know, particularly in permanent crop systems, you just can't do that and have biocontrol working for you. Okay. That's great. And from a communications perspective, is there anything, Denise, that you would say look at to help vegetable growers or varying crops? Uh, well, I, and I think it does come down to understanding your audience. And so if you're understanding the different contexts that they're, that they're in, then you're able to signal that you do understand the pressures and the challenges they're facing so that you don't come in going, oh, here's the best thing since sliced bread. You're actually coming in going, hey, we do understand. Um, mm -hmm. We do know the challenges that you face. And that at least will get you a bit of a listening ear, potentially, um, to see what could be done um yeah rather than coming in going have we got the answer for you yeah great well actually one one little extra piece one extra question i suppose in this communication space is anyone using social media for outreach and extension and how's that going uh, there's some great examples of yep. um, the use of social media out there, um, some of which have been written up in the APEN journal. I do want to do a bit of a plug for the Rural Extension and Innovation Systems Journal. It's a very practical extension focused, available freely online on the APEN website, APEN dot org dot au um, and there's some really great articles in there on the use of social media in extension and extension campaigns uh, and extension programs uh, it can work really really well but it all comes back to understanding your audience yes. um, and <laughs> how you use it are you using it in a way that's um, how, like in a flipped learning kind of way, are you using it to get interest to then, you know, get people along to programs or are you using it in a way to support programs that are that are already out there and this is a way of making sure that people know about the resources and stuff so that when they're away, you know, they've done their activity and they're um, then uh, uh, trying to implement something, they know where to go um, to get the information that they need. So I think it's about thinking about how you're using it um, rather than just like, oh, it'll work. Let's it will work. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. But how how are you going to use it? Yeah. 
No, great. And um, and with that link, what I'll uh, I'll say is that we will put that link in our emails when we say the resources are there, so that people can actually click through as well awesome. and see those yep. those resources because this is all about practical yep. um, pieces. So I'm going to ask the next question, which actually was asked in quite a few different ways, but very very similar question, and obviously is hitting hard for our uh, growers and our farmers and our orchardists uh, around the country. So how do you promote adoption and practice change in difficult financial times and also when growers are hugely time challenged, which we all know is happening with all the farm plans and uh, water, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so when growers are time cha challenged and already dealing with regulated or mandated changes. Denise, would you like to go first? I'm just going to throw to you. <laughs> yeah, no worries. And, and I'm going to sound like a broken record because I'm like, well, if we if we can say a signal that we understand our audience, that we're not coming in tone deaf, that we are recognizing the challenges. Um, and, and then we're also thinking about realistically about the changes and things we might be promoting. Do they actually really help um, save time? Uh, you know, which ones are we actually getting out there? Because I think maybe taking a bit of a rigorous lens to the suite of things that we might be thinking about and going, well, hey, we've been talking about all of these things. Here's where we think the top three are in terms of time saving, in terms of things you can do that you can integrate without maybe heaps of resource involved um, that still might have an impact. Uh, yeah. Maybe it's starting there. That's that's my starter for 10. Um, I'm interested to hear what the other panelists say too. I also think that anything you can do, sorry, um, that encourages that peer-to-peer -peer learning um, yeah. and, and hearing from other growers is going to be incredibly invaluable in that because we are not going to know all the answers. We aren't going to know all of the different ways that you know, what could happen. So Jim, you were talking about the discussion groups. Um, we saw that in action groups in the Red Meat Profit Partnership Program. It's that learning from people, other farmers and other growers who understand that context and who understand intimately what works and what doesn't work. That's gold. And anything you can do to pr to help promote that will also have some nice spin-offs in terms of mental health and well-being because you're getting that social interaction as well. So yeah. that would be Great, gold. great piece. Yeah. Trevor, I saw your hands go up. Yeah. Uh, I think for us, it's quite often finding actually what the grower or farmer is focused on. And we have a number of times found that they are resistant to change, not because of financial pressures necessarily directly, but because they're focused on production and yield. Mm. And we need to address that focus and say, why are you focused on production and yield when it's possibly not the best system? And in fact, invariably, it isn't the best fit, um, solution. If I just might make a little digression here and go to a situation that I addressed with a, a dairy farmer a few years ago, who was spending a large amount of money. In fact, he was spending $180,000 on weed control to maintain production. And I said, well, my answer to you is to find out how many cows you need to produce that $180,000, reduce your herd by that number of cows, have less time in the shed, and your pastures will be healthier and you will not need to spray those weeds. Didn't work. Fell on yeah. deaf ears. He wanted to maintain yield. Now, I yeah. think that thinking is unfortunately quite universal in all sectors and possibly where we first need to talk to, to growers in some instances. Not all, but just some. I think that's a problem. Mm. No, completely agreed. Jeff or Jim, like to jump in? Um, yeah, following on from what Trevor and Denise were saying, if farmers have and growers have other priorities, <clears throat> which doesn't include doing what you want them to do, it becomes pretty important to find out what those priorities are and what why they have those priorities and what you may be able to do to support them 
with those priorities and keeping your powder dry and not trying to push something on them that they're not ready for or don't have time for and spending some time preparing for when they are ready. Mm. So it's about, it's not always about having to push the technology onto people. Sometimes it's about, well, all you can do is wait till they're ready and they have the time and the opportunity. And I love that meeting people where they're at because that way you build up the trust, you build yes. up um, all of that good stuff that stands yeah. you in good stead for when they come back to you and you're going, oh, hey, remember, we're, yeah. we've got this really great stuff. Yep. About which which is like Jim's experience, I think. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. It's just a great example. Yeah, I'd like to add to Jeff's point because, you know, in many ways, you know, sort of a researcher-led IPM systems, you know, we want to monitor everything, you know, we make it more complicated than what we need to. So I think part of the success is actually pairing it back to what is needed to make critical decisions in, nice. in your orchard and taking away sort of some of the routine than maybe the nice to have or you don't really need to have. And I mean, I look at some of the... Um, uh, programs, the sustainability programs around the industry are that at the moment, thinking, hmm, do we need, really need to be monitoring all that? Who's using that information and what decision is it informing? So keep it simple. And if you can keep it simple, then it's more readily included and becomes an enduring part of everyday business. Yeah. Yeah. No, very good love point. It. Yeah, really love it. Um, there's so many good points in today's webinar. It's just incredible. I literally uh, just thought while you were talking, Jim, uh, that it would be wonderful to get in closing just a, if you could tell our fabulous uh, audience who, by the way, most have stuck through for the three hours, which I am stoked about. So thank you for being here. Um, but if you could think about one key takeaway. So if they're going to switch off and go to lunch today, what is the one thing from you? that you'd like them to walk away from. And I'm going to throw it to Jeff. You're on the top left-hand corner of my screen. <laughs> okay. well, uh, <laughs> you can, never know, all, you can never know too much about your audience. There you go. Thank you. Brilliant. Jim, what's the one I, big takeaway? I, I think is innovation. You and being and seeking a premium position for everything that you do. If you do that and embrace that, you're always going to be in the right part of the market. Nice one. Uh, Trevor? Ask questions and never, ever be embarrassed about the sort of question you're asking. It doesn't matter how simple it is or, or whatever. Experts or people that give advice uh, never, ever worry about that we address them the way they come. So important if there's an issue there, ask questions, get clarification. It doesn't matter what it is, whether it's financial, a bug, a pest, a disease, a process that you're unsure of, don't hide. Please ask questions. Fantastic. And Denise? And I would follow that up by saying, ask questions, listen to the answers, and then plan. Uh, so yeah, a little bit of planning and not and not thinking it has to stick to the plan, but doing a little bit of thinking, doing some, you know, doing some stuff and then checking and then revising your plan is yeah, that's gold. Fantastic. Well, I'm gonna ask all the all the participants to think about what are the one or two key takeaways for you. Write it down and answer the question. Tomorrow I'm gonna start to do. X, Y, Z differently. Because it's one thing listening to this webinar, but actually you should be taking away some of these gold nuggets and starting to implement and starting to think through. So are you going to plan? Are you going to talk to your target audience or define your target audience? Ask good questions, innovate, have a wee think about what you're, you're going to do tomorrow. So on that, I am going to say a massive thank you to our incredible uh, panel today. Jeff, Jim, Trevor, and Denise, thank you so much for joining us um, on this journey uh, into the world of extensions. Um, and I also want to do a big thank you to uh, the uh, team behind this 
this webinar. Gina Jewell, who you would all have known, has done all the work in the advertising and pulling this whole thing together and making it look seamless. Uh, Sarah, as well, has been behind the scenes with all the questions and answers. So just thank you uh, immensely to the Elida Touch team. Uh, they're working very hard to ensure that our crops are, are growing with a far lighter environmental touch. So this is one, as I said, of the educational forums. Uh, our next one is coming up in March. So be uh, alert to that one. That will be uh, in Pukekohe live. So that'll be exciting. Um, also, just a reminder, the resources, so all the presentations, as well as the webinar itself, we're going to throw onto our website under the resource section, and we'll email all the participants when they're live, and we'll include that link, Denise, to um, APEN, A-P-E-N, is it? Yeah, APEN, that's right, yep. APEN.org.au. Uh, of course, thank you to everyone who stuck it out and attended today. Um, I hope that you've got so much from this. I know I have, uh, constantly learning. And finally, a very big thank you to our partners, our industry partners, all 15 of them that are part of the Elida Touch program, as well as our crop protection companies, Cortiva, Syngenta, and Key Industries, without which we wouldn't be here. And big, big, big thank you to MPI, because without you, we wouldn't all be here as well. So thank you to all of our partners. Uh, to make this uh, possibility and we won't be far we, you'll see us again shortly and if I can ask the panelists to remain online um, but everybody else you're free to go I gave you back nine minutes how's that nine minutes off you go back into your day and take all these learnings with you thank you thank you again <laughs>